Welcome to Mystic Realms Recap. Links are in the description below. Please show some love of the author and me. On to the show. The Sire Bandits were very surprised now too as they were not aware that the Tower of Dusk had brought in the Malfa family as backup. They had thought that they would have been able to wipe out at least half of the Tower of Dusk's team with the offensive spells earlier and completely finish them off with the Alchemy Colossus. A guild that had only been around for a few months was insignificant in their eyes as any of the ten archmages was capable of leading a guild themselves. However, even after the ten archmages did all they could to attack them, the magical defense barrier of the Tower of Dusk remained operational, albeit barely. That was embarrassing for the people hovering in the sky as the amount of mana they had depleted in the short attack was astonishing. It would have been alright if they had gained something, but it seemed like the mana they had depleted earlier was completely useless. Even an archmage could be easily defeated if they had depleted their mana too early on. Now, they could only rely on the alchemy colossuses to break down their defense barrier. Without that, they were sure that it was only a matter of time before they achieved victory. After a short discussion, they decided to change their tactics and focus on shielding the alchemy colossuses. The people from the Tower of Dusk were aware of how scary the alchemy colossuses were as well. They formed a group whose main focus was to do all they could to halt the approaching alchemy colossuses. Unfortunately, they were limited in what they could do, each alchemy colossus was already well equipped to defend itself, and with the ten archmages shielding them from the sky, it seemed almost impossible to slow them down. While it had been an exciting fight filled with sludge spells and frost spells, the alchemy colossuses continued to move closer despite their efforts. The archers of the sire bandits, who were behind the alchemy colossuses, all raised their bows and aimed their arrows at the Tower of Dusk's campsite even though it was useless. Some of these arrows fell before they even reached the camp, while some of them were repelled by the defense barrier, but these people did not seem to care, just as though their only goal was to annoy the others as they continued to shoot their arrows. What good was this? It was like attacking a WYRM with wooden sticks. The mages from the Tower of Dusk had experience dealing with alchemy colossuses, hence, they were not as flustered as the mages from the Malfa family who began to panic as the alchemy colossuses moved closer. That was hardly their fault as the mages from the Tower of Dusk were barely any better when they'd first faced an alchemy colossus. They did not spend the last couple of months in the Dragon Mountains in vain, however. Hence, as Jirian led them against the sire bandits, Hutton could not help but watch and envy how well trained they were. This can't go on, the defense barrier will be destroyed sooner or later. Seeing as Linley did not mention anything, Jirian took the initiative to lead. As they were not in an advantageous position, he decisively commanded, give up the defense barrier and form small groups to fight the enemy. Since it'd be destroyed anyway, they might as well give it up now, and take the initiative. It was natural to become reliant on something that could save their lives, hence, nobody would want to give it up. The Malthus thought that since there was a barrier that could block attacks, there was no sense in them having to fight. Even if the barrier would not hold up for long, they could always wait until it was down before they fought. However, the mages from the Tower of Dusk were already used to following orders immediately and saving their questions for later. Seeing as those from the Tower of Dusk had already given up on holding up the barrier, the Malthus could not do anything but follow along and curse inwardly. What? Damn it, what kind of order is this? We can barely survive, yet you want to give it up now? Yerik was in charge of passing the message to the Malfa family and he could not help but scream in anger, yet he could not do anything about it. There was no place for him to act out of anger, as he might put himself in danger. The enemy attack did not stop even though the defense barrier had vanished, and they wreaked havoc in their campsite. The tents were swept away and torn into pieces, and the traces of offensive spells could be seen on the ground, be it charred black or frosted white. There were even holes and cracks. Thankfully, the mages from both sides had already prepared themselves, hence, there were no casualties from these attacks. After the attacks, they followed Jirian's instructions and formed groups to head towards their targets. Thud. 
An archmage from the Malfas had just begun using a levitation spell when an alchemy colossus reacted with speed ill befitting of its size and smacked him down like a fly. Idiot! Does he think he is a legendary mage? Fancy using the levitation spell in front of an alchemy colossus, Gavin silently mocked him. He was not in the least bit sorry for this unbearably arrogant guy. Still, they were allies, and they could not afford to stab each other in the back in the face of an enemy. Seeing as the alchemy colossus was heading towards the guy who had fallen, Gavin hurriedly brought his companions and headed towards it. While the people from the Tower of Dusk were unable to defeat the alchemy colossus, they were able to delay it for some time based on their experience in dealing with it. The archmage carter, who'd been shot down sheepishly climbed up, thankful that he had used a defensive spell earlier, which saved him from being beaten into mush. Shaking his head, he looked around and could not help but admire those from the Tower of Dusk. It was a common sight to see on a battlefield. While the mages from the Tower of Dusk were not as powerful as those from the Malfa family individually, they were much more powerful combined. While working together might mean deciding what to do in terms of attacking and defending after looking at what their companions were doing, it might mean that their actions would be delayed. On the other hand, those from the Tower of Dusk seemed to be able to predict their companions' actions and worked flawlessly together like an incredibly precise machine. With such teamwork, they were able to protect themselves even though they could not cause any harm to the Alchemy Colossus. This was an achievement in itself as the Alchemy Colossus was not only incredibly hardy, but it could also easily break a wall with its power with movements that were not restricted by their size as they were as nimble as a man's. Hence, it was not an easy feat to be able to escape an alchemy colossus and skate, much less be able to do so while fighting it. Hutton saw how well the people of the Tower of Dusk worked together, and was as impressed with it as he had been with the alchemy colossus. Was this not the team he had dreamed of? Moving his gaze towards his own mages, he could not help but turn red. There were differences in cooperating styles. The Tower of Dusk made use of a method that allowed them to make up for their individually lacking power with sheer numbers. This was something that Lin Lee had come up with based on games he had played, and its main purpose was to make up for the lack of high-leveled mages in the Tower of Dusk. With their fancy footwork, they led the alchemy colossus in circles and escaped at the very last second from what looked to be a fatal blow. Meanwhile, the Malfa family, like most forces, trained their mages to cooperate like soldiers. All the commands and formations focused on firing spells at the same time and defending using formations. Their goal was to win by oppressing the enemy with magic, which was by winning in power. Even then, most mages were not motivated to train even such simple maneuvers, as they enjoyed a high status and nobody could force them to do what they did not want to. The mages from the Maltha family stood in a formation and were trying to defeat the alchemy colossus using magic, but the problem was that their magic did not work on the alchemy colossus. Seeing that it did not have an effect, all they could do was gather around the alchemy colossus and attack together, yet due to their lack of teamwork, they were a mess, even obstructing their teammates' escape sometimes. The situation in the sky was much like what happened on the ground as the ten archmages were comparable to an alchemy colossus. As they lacked powerhouses, the allies could only make up for it with numbers and maintain a deadlock for now, but anyone could tell that this was not sustainable, as a small mistake could be fatal in battle, and they were facing level 18 archmages too. While level was not everything, these archmages were great at seizing opportunities, and casualties appeared amongst the Malfa family's mages due to their inability to cooperate well with each other. While the fight was exciting, everyone was clearly aware that the Tower of Dusk and the Malfa family were merely holding on. Yet, the strange thing was that an outsider would not have been able to tell which side had the upper hand. After the fight started, the first to die were the foot soldiers of the Sire Bandits, those from the Tower of Dusk were already angered from being oppressed for so long so they directed their anger at these foot soldiers who were far too easy to deal with compared to the alchemy colossus. Hence, something strange happened, even though the sire bandits had the upper hand, they were the ones who screamed for help. Those foot soldiers did not have the ability to go against mages, while the ten archmages and the alchemy colossuses could not be bothered to deal with them. Sadly, they could not even measure up to ashes 
as even though these foot soldiers were exterminated, that made no difference for the situation. The ten archmages and the alchemy colossuses were an unbeatable presence on the battlefield. Sheesh, what the hell are these things made of? Seeing their magic leave no trace on the alchemy colossuses made everyone feel hopeless, yet they could not stop. It was as futile and depressing as an ant trying to chew through an elephant's skin, only to realize that it was merely a tickle for the latter. These alchemy colossuses were difficult to deal with as they were too well equipped to defend themselves. The materials and magic used to make them were very powerful, and the alchemy array also provided magical defenses, which was another layer of defense. They were designed for use on the battlefield, after all, so they could not be too frail. There were about twenty archmages from both the Tower of Dusk and the Malfa family, but the most powerful of them was only level seventeen. The Tower of Dusk did not have as many archmages as the Malfa family, as they had only been around for a couple of months, and even these archmages were introduced by Basel. Linley was not in a hurry, however, as the only problem he had was a lack of time. He already had the ingredients for the rune potion ready, all he needed was time to make it. With the amount of dragon's tongue he had, he could make at least ten rune potions, and that meant ten archmages. The Tower of Dusk would surely experience a huge increase in power then. This was the reason why pharmacists enjoyed a higher status than mages in Amrel. Even if someone was limited by their talent and could only remain a mage apprentice, all they had to do was take a potion, and they would become a mage. Even if they could not do anything in the future, this business was profitable. There were potions for every bottleneck a mage could meet on their journey, it only depended on whether someone could come up with it. While this might be difficult for other pharmacists, it was nothing to Linley, who was a pharmaceutics guru. Dressed in the sunset robes, Alan hovered in the air as he held the sunset magic staff tightly in his hands, looking at the enemy. Even though he knew that they were level 18 archmages, he was not afraid. He had only joined the Tower of Dusk because of Mr. Basel, his teacher, but now he knew that it was a blessing for him to be able to join the Tower of Dusk. Sunset robes, sunset magic staff, and the sunset ring, this was the sunset set, one of the highest quality sets there were. It was far more expensive than what any mage could afford. If not because he had joined the Tower of Dusk, there would have been no way he would be able to touch any of them in his life. The material gains were not the most important to Alan, as he had been stuck at a bottleneck because of a bad habit, something that even his teacher could not do anything about. Yet, that young president was able to get rid of this bad habit with a seemingly simple method. Having been in the Dragon Mountains for two months and with the accumulated experience he had from the bottleneck, he was finally able to break through it and reach level 15, becoming a true archmage. Now, the young president Felic enjoyed a similar status as his beloved teacher Basel in Alan's heart. President Felic was watching from the ground now and even if his opponent was a level 18 archmage, he could not afford to embarrass the Tower of Dusk in this fight. An orange light lit up on the sunset ring as Alan struck first. Even though he was at lower level, he could make up for it by fighting as though his life depended on it. The worst thing one could face was an opponent who fought with disregard for his own life, but this was not something just anyone could do. If Alan still had been a level 14 magic shooter, it would have been futile even if he fought that way, but now that he was a level 15 archmage, it was different. Even though it was only one level higher, it was vastly different. Besides, he also had the sunset set, and that was why he was able to stop a level 18 archmage when he fought like his life depended on it. The fight in the sky was far more exciting than the one on the ground as the dozen or so archmages fought, and sparks flew like fireworks in a celebration. Once in a while, someone could be seen falling from the sky with a loud cry, but unfortunately, none of them were the enemy. The four alchemy colossuses stood up suddenly as though they were annoyed at having their companions in the sky stealing the limelight. The complicated alchemy array on their bodies lit up randomly, and it shone brightly as though a magical machine gun was getting ready to fire. The surrounding people were sent flying instantly, but thankfully, they remembered their shields, the most important thing to remember when fighting an alchemy colossus. While you might not be able to touch or hit it, you had to make sure that you did not die when it did. The enemy had the upper hand, 
be it on the land or in the sky, and the Allies were only barely holding on. This could not last long, as they might all suffer a complete defeat the next second. President Felick, what do we do now? Facing such a powerful enemy, Hutton was incredibly anxious. He'd brought all the elites from the Malfa family, and if they were to all die here, the Malfas would be quiet for a long time. However, when he tried to ask Felic, he nearly lost his mind in anger. How could the owner of the Tower of Dusk, the young president of the Breezy Plains Guild of Magic, be toying around with something on the ground at a time like this? Does he think that he can draw a few circles and curse the enemy, and they would leave of their own accord? Hey, you're the leader for a reason. If not because he knew that Linley was a legendary mage, Hutton would have jumped on him and given him a beating. However, he could only think about it in his head as he would surely die a death much worse than being stepped on by the alchemy colossus if he did try it. While Hutton did not have the guts to say that, he had men who feared nothing, they did not know what Felic was capable of anyway. Yerrick in particular hated Lin Lee very much, especially because he had just been scolded by Hutton earlier. Young Master Hutton, we cannot hold on for long, let's retreat so that we can at least preserve some strength. Yerrick came before Hutton, embarrassed as his eyes glanced towards Linley, who seemed to be busy with something for no reason, and felt his anger rise. Hey you, everyone is fighting with their lives out there. If I had to die for the Malfa family, I would accept it, but what are we doing this for? Hutton was conflicted as well. Who knew this would be such a difficult task? Weren't they the remnant of the sire bandits? Why were there alchemy colossuses and ten archmages? His only hope was in President Felic, but there he was, toying with something randomly. Actually, so what if he did something? Right, he was a legendary mage, but he had only been one for a few days. Those alchemy colossuses were all nearly equal to a legendary magical beast, even if his teacher Cheyenne were here, he might have to order a retreat as well. If they were to go hard against them, then there would be a hefty price to pay, they were sure to suffer huge losses. Wait a while longer, have them all hold on for a bit more, Hutton told Yerrick. If they were to retreat now, then his potions deal with President Felic made the day before would be moot. Hey you, this might be rude, but you call yourself the president of the Breezy Plains Guild of Magic? Yerrick said a little louder on purpose so that he would be heard over the sounds of explosions even far away. He wanted those from the Tower of Dusk to know that while they were fighting with their lives, their president was hiding in the back, doing God knew what. Yerrick, that's enough, President Felic has his reasons. Hutton scolded with a frown before he looked over at the busy President Felic, not knowing how to describe the way he felt. Ever since he had helped his father manage the family's affairs, he had never been at a loss as much as today. Logically speaking, it was evident that they were on the losing end and there was no way out besides to retreat. Yet, there was a tiny voice inside his head, telling him to persist and that a miracle would happen. Could the young president who created many miracles continue doing so today? If there was going to be a miracle, what would it be? How could they survive this? No matter how they thought about it, for alchemy colossuses seemed like too difficult a task. Unless that young president suddenly broke into the sanctuary realm or if someone from sanctuary realm came forth to help them. Hutton was on the verge of tearing out his hair, this was too torturous. Yerrick saw Hutton hesitate, hence, he disregarded the previous scoldings, and continued yelling, Humph, the Supreme Council must be crazy to let such a nobody become the president of Guild, yet there are so many people willing to risk their lives for him. To his dismay, the mages from the Tower of Dusk were not affected by it, and only his companions from the Malfa family were distracted and injured as a result of it. Ridiculous, our people are sacrificing themselves for you, so what are you doing right now? Hearing the cries of his companions, Yerrick's anger rose, and he turned towards the young president, wanting to give him a piece of his mind even though he might be scolded by Hutton. Yerrick, what are you doing? Hutton was shocked and quickly pulled Yerrick aside forcefully. Linley was a legendary mage, so even if he might not be able to deal with the four alchemy colossuses, he was more than enough to deal with Yerrick. Young Master Hutton, don't stop me. How can this cowardly fellow be a president? I must show everyone what he truly is. Yerrick shouted in anger. All right, 
Why don't you go and help your companions instead of worrying about things like that? Hutton said angrily. Even though he was upset with Linley, he dared not trifle with the legendary mage. Hutton had intentionally allowed Yarrick to say more so as to make Linley do something, even if the latter was upset, Hutton could just say that his subordinate was not thinking straight. But the worst thing was that even after all Yarrick had said, this president did not seem to care, just as though he had not heard anything. He continued to gather ingredients as though he was preparing for an experiment, but his men and allies were out there, risking their lives, was it really time to experiment now? Truth to be told, Linley had no time to care about what anyone said or Yarrick's outburst, so he paid no attention to any of that. Everything around him, from the battle in the sky and on the ground to the explosions and the cries of the injured, had been blocked out by him. All his focus was on the magical ingredients in front of him. Linley had not thought that the sire bandits would have the alchemy colossuses, something comparable to a legendary magical beast in terms of combat power. With four alchemy colossuses, even he would not be able to deal with them quickly, and to top it off, there were also ten level eighteen archmages. He could have summoned his undead servants, humorous W.Y.R.M., Ujfalusi, Norfeller, and the eighteen death knights, and the battle could be easily won, but then he would have to suffer a big loss, and his death knights would definitely decrease in number again. He could not bear to. While he might seem generous, always giving out potions and magical equipment to others and providing his men with high-quality equipment, these were all investments to him, high-return investments, in fact. He was never one to get involved in a business that would bring him losses. Take those death knights, for example, he deeply regretted it after some of them had died in the scar of death, they were all potential retribution knights. While these death knights were not that significant as they were currently, with the most powerful one only at level 18 and some of them were even level 15, they could all be groomed into retribution knights. Linley used to think that it was impossible to groom all 18 death knights into retribution knights, but now that he had an opportunity to get the arm of the immortal king, it did seem like he had a chance. Of course, he would do so if he was left with no other choice, but now he had a better alternative to going head-on with the enemy. Disintegrating Array, an alchemy array used by many alchemists. Its main purpose was to disintegrate an alchemy array, such as the one modifying an alchemy colossus. Many precious ingredients were needed to make an alchemy colossus, and were not readily available most of the time. Hence, they'd be replaced with normal ingredients first, and those replaced with others once available. Often, many modifications were needed to craft an alchemy colossus, especially when it was built by an individual alchemist. Many alchemists only used normal ingredients to craft the alchemy colossus at first, and only replaced the parts bit by bit when they obtained more appropriate ingredients. The replacement was also unlike a simple replacement of parts, as the material could be different and have different tolerance. Hence, in order to maximize the effect of each ingredient, the alchemy array also had to be continually modified, or else the replacement of ingredients would have no effect. As the alchemy arrays on the alchemy colossus were not separate but closely connected to each other, modifying one of them often required the modification of a dozen others as well. It was like replacing a gear in a machine, it had to fit right in with the rest, and then, a chain reaction was inevitable. Sometimes, one was better off starting all over again rather than modifying an alchemy array. If only normal ingredients were used, then it would be easy to start over when making an individual part. Nearer the end, however, there would be more precious ingredients that would require modifications, and the losses from a mistake would become bigger, more than an average person could afford. Hence, an alchemy master created the disintegrating array which would allow them to wipe away part of the alchemy array without harming the ingredients. Science was a double-edged sword, however, and it was also the case in Amrel. The disintegrating array was merely an auxiliary array that would make the job of an Amrel easier. However, someone thought of using it in war, and made winning far too easy. In order to protect themselves against such unscrupulous tactics, alchemists started looking for ways to prevent their alchemy array from disintegrating while those who studied the disintegrating array studied new ways to modify the disintegrating array. This conflict continued until today, and now the disintegrating array was not a foolproof method, 
but depended on who was using it and on what. The four alchemy colossuses were all near the legendary level, but they were not quite there yet, which meant that the alchemist who made them was merely an alchemist master. Since an archmage and a legendary mage were worlds apart, so was an alchemist master and an alchemist guru. A disintegrating array created by an alchemist guru like Lin Li was more than enough to deal with the creations of an alchemist master. After all, the creations of an alchemist master were too amateurish in the eyes of an alchemist guru. Lin Li squatted unceremoniously on the ground, a huge double-edged sword in front of him serving as a tabletop. He placed each ingredient carefully on the wide surface of the sword and started working once the ingredients were all laid out, his hands moving so quickly they blurred. Firstly, he mixed the ingredients, blood of a high-ranking magical beast, juice of a rare magical plant, and the powder of a crushed high-ranking magical crystal, all measured precisely before they were mixed. If other alchemists saw this, they would scold Linley for wasting precious ingredients, fancy using these only to make a disintegrating array something that was no longer as powerful in the eyes of other alchemists. While Linley might not be able to create the most perfect disintegrating array in a hurry, he would be able to get rid of the problem before him now with these precious ingredients. This was no waste to Linley as long as the ingredients did what they were supposed to. Moreover, this was nothing to him, he had yet to count the riches accumulated over the years in the throne of darkness. After setting aside the mixture, Linley took the standard equipment of the Tower of Dusk, a sunset magic staff. In his opinion, this was the most suitable equipment to modify, and he intended to turn it into a disintegrating array equipment as the sunset magic staff should be able to cope with the changes in Array 1. Linley then took out a crystal pen and filled it with the mixture before using it as a fountain pen and writing on the sunset magic staff. A sizzling sound could be heard when mixture touched the magic staff leaving slightly translucent silver markings on the magic staff. Young Master Hutton, we cannot fight any more, let's retreat. Yarrick had come back to Hutton again, but this time not of his own accord, he had been forced back by the enemy. He was not alone, the mages from the Tower of Dusk and the Malfa family were all forced to retreat into a tiny space. Hutton did not waste any time and waved the magic staff in his hand, sending a spell at the enemy. He was a level 19 archmage, after all, and him joining alleviated the burden on the others. But still, it did not change the situation at all. President Felic, please do something, or else we're all going to die. Seeing his men fall one by one, Hutton could not help but panic, they were all the elites he had. Young master, let's retreat, we've already done our part. What else could he do even if he joined the fight? Yarrick glared at the busy Lin Li before a thought surfaced in his head, and he quickly whispered in Hutton's ear. Young master, this is a chance for you. Hutton frowned before he lowered his voice, confused, and asked, what chance? Young master, this felic is not acting like a president at all. He does not care about his men at all, and they may already be upset with him. Why not take this chance to help them? As long as half of them remember our help, then the Malfa family can, while Yarrick did not fancy Linley, he could still tell that the mages of the Tower of Dusk were useful, and thus he plotted to steal them from Linley. Hun was taken aback, and could not help glancing over at Linley, afraid that the latter heard what they were talking about. Seeing that Linley showed no reaction, he breathed out a sigh of relief, before glaring angrily at Yarrick, and said, Shut up. We are allies, how can we do this? You'd better get this thought out of your head. Hutton was envious of the mages that the Tower of Dusk had, but he reminded himself that this felic was a monster, how could you even think about offending a twenty-years-old legendary mage? While he knew that Yarrick had good intentions, and that this method could be used on other groups, just because they could not escape from the ten level eighteen archmages and the alchemy colossuses did not mean that this felic could not. Damn it! Where did the decisive young master, from their past victories, who was the one who could not keep their eyes off these mages, as if they were beauties go to? Yarrick was incredibly frustrated, he had come up with such a good idea, yet his young master was too preoccupied with respecting his ally. Where did being loyal get you to these days? An ally was meant to be betrayed. Young master, I have the good of the Malfas at heart. You see, this president may be cowardly, 
but his mages are really quite decent. If we can win them over, then at least we would have gained something from this trip. Yarek continued persuading Hutton. Shut up. Hun was so afraid that he felt his soul leaving him and forced his words out through gritted teeth. Damn it, cowardly? Even the High Lord of the Abyss of Tharlan has fallen in Felix's hands, what is there that he cannot do? You want to steal his mages? I will be thankful if he does not steal mine. Yarek could not comprehend the way Hutton was acting, and could not help thinking that Hutton had to know something about this President Felix after spending so much time with him. Why else would he be so defensive about this fellow? Seeing that his persuasion was futile, Yarek could only take a step back and consider the alternatives. If he could not steal these mages, surely he had to make sure that he did not die here as well? Hence, he tried again. Young Master, Hutton, no matter what, we must retreat. If all the elites die here, what are you going to tell the council? They were already at conflict with the council when they set off on this trip. And if the elites really all died here like Yarek said, Hutton would be in huge trouble with the council. Hutton hesitated and looked over at the battlefield, and saw that both the mages from the Tower of Dusk and the Malfa family were struggling to hold on against the enemy who had already gained the upper hand. It was only a matter of time before they suffered a complete defeat. Looking at those injured, he could not help being angry that most of them were from the Malfa family, with only three mages from the Tower of Dusk. Young master, give the command now, we cannot afford to delay any longer. Yarek shouted anxiously. Hutton raised his hand slowly and let it drop heavily, all while Yarek watched on, but his next words made Yarek feel faint. Hutton's voice was a little hoarse, but his attitude was firm when he said, Endure a little more, my friends. If we can get through this together, I'll surely reward you accordingly after this. Young, Yarek opened his mouth wanting to continue persuading, but he was cut off by a voice that suddenly came from the side. Thankfully, I made it. Linley finally finished the last stroke and linked the disintegrating array to the sunset magic staff. Light seemed to flow through the writings, to the magic array. The twenty-four nodes covering the staff lit up one by one, while the silvery translucent substance that formed the lines, connecting the entire magical array, seemed to glow with a faint silvery light as the light flowed through it. When Lenly had first arrived in Jerosis, he had feuded with the local magical family and arranged a duel with their heir. Before the duel, he had crafted a gold rod with deep silver, and used this gold rod to dissolve the advanced magic of his opponent into nothing. But still, this was not something used in fights and he did not use it much after that. How was he going to touch another mage with a rod in a fight, after all? The effect of the disintegrating array was different from yet somewhat similar to the way the gold rod worked, but they were both unorthodox methods and duels. While there were people who used it for a period of time when the alchemy array was in vogue, it was still only an auxiliary method, and ultimately something used chiefly in production. However, there was no rule saying that he couldn't use it for something else, Thus, the disintegrating array was no longer a tool of production in Linley's hands. Hey, you're awake. What a time to be awake, though. If you were any later, you would be the only one left here. Yarek had been chided by Hutton because of Linley, so although he spoke sarcastically, he was already holding back quite a bit. Hutton glared at Yarek before anxiously telling Linley, President Felic, you are finally done. I guess there is no need for further introduction of the situation. I wonder what our next step should be. Yarek was quite upset with Hutton, and thus he ignored the glare and continued mocking, Yeah, President Felic, I hope you can turn the tables around and allow our men to retreat now. Yarek, shut up. Hutton quickly shouted at him to stop in shock, and silently scolded him in his mind. Damn it, you can go ahead if you're courting death, but don't drag the Malfa family down with you. Young master, wake up, do you really think he can turn the situation around? Who knows how he became president, but I know for sure it was not by ability. Look at him now, his allies and men are fighting with their lives on the line, yet he is not doing anything, and even left the job of commanding them to someone else. What is there that he can do? Yarek was furious, and even his attitude towards Hutton was bad. Whom was he kidding? Even if Master Cheyenne was here, 
It would not be an easy task to deal with these people, even a legendary mage would have trouble with the four alchemy colossuses because they were too hardy. President Felic was a 21 years old youth, and at most an archmage, so it would make no difference if he did anything. Hutton was a sight to behold. What was he to do with such a disrespectful subordinate? Fearing that Yarrick might have annoyed President Felic, it would not have been an issue if this was a wasted trip, but now he did not know whether his subordinate hadn't deeply offended President Felic. Hutton was so angry that he raised his magic staff and was about to hit him with it, but just as he raised his magic staff, he saw that Yarrick had turned pale and froze like a statue, almost as though he had seen something terrifying. Hutton cursed in his mind. Damn it, you were happily chiding away, and even asked me to wake up, now who is the one who looks like an idiot? But soon Hutton realized Yarrick wasn't scared of him. A figure flew ahead, it was President Felic, who had been busy with God knew what earlier. Yarrick was on the verge of breaking down, or perhaps he already had, and it took all his strength to remain standing there. He never thought that the supposedly cowardly and incapable fellow he was scolding was a damn legendary mage. An archmage could only use a levitation spell to fly, but a legendary mage was different. Yarrick saw that Linley did not even utter a word, nor did the magical wave around him change before he flew into the sky as though it was second instinct for him. He had offended a legendary mage. The person he had been making snide remarks about for the whole day was actually a legendary mage. This twenty-odd years old president was actually a legendary mage. All these unbelievable thoughts seemed to hammer away at his nerves, and it was only a matter of time before they snapped. Yarrick was very regretful now. Even though there was another legendary mage, Cheyenne, in the Malfa family, yet Yarrick had offended a legendary mage because of something trivial. He had seen many conflicts in such a big family, and he was aware of what would happen in the end, he would inevitably be sacrificed in order to appease the other party. But whom could he blame? He was the cause of this, and Hutton had tried again and again to stop him, yet he could not contain his anger enough to see through this. Hutton felt his worry settle a little as he watched Linley fly into battle. While any other legendary mage would have made no difference against ten archmages and the four alchemy colossuses, this President Felic was no ordinary legendary mage, anyone would be a fool to think so. Since President Felic had made a move, he did not have to worry no matter what he decided to do. Hutton was no longer worried about the battle, but the moment he turned to look at Yarrick, who still stood there stunned, he felt his anger rising again. Yarrick, what do you think of this dream of mine? Am I awake or not? What a nightmare, how he hoped that he was in a nightmare. Yarrick felt like he might be better off dying, not only had he offended a legendary mage, he had also offended his young master. He silently scolded himself for it, now he did not even have someone to stand up for him, damn it. Yarrick, I thought you had a lot to say earlier. Why are you not saying anything now? Hutton became angrier the more he thought about it, not only because Yarrick had been rude to him earlier, but also because he was worried that his relationship with President Felic would sour due to this bastard. Young Master, Hutton, I, I, I. I really didn't know that President Felic was a legendary mage. Damn it, so you know you're wrong now, huh? Humph. Hutton snorted and said, if you want to apologize, you should wait until President Felic is back before you say it yourself. But a sorry might not work. Hutton silently added. He knew that young president's personality better than anyone else, he might ignore you completely and smile at whatever you do, but when things became serious, you'd better start praying. Sorry? Even a kowtow might not work. The young President Felic was a legendary mage. Not only Yarrick was shocked, even those from the Tower of Dusk were stunned. Twenty years old, even the god of mages Jeresco did not reach the legendary realm, by the age of twenty, Jirian the fatty, forgot to close his mouth as he looked on. He, who knew Felic better than most, secretly thought to himself, damn it, he was only a level seven or eight mage when he first arrived in Jerosis, and only started learning magic not too long ago. He seems to improve at a tremendous speed, and just like that, he has become a legendary mage. Ever since Andoin, there had not been a figure like that in Jerosis, and Jirian was upset that he had nothing boast about whenever he met other mages. 
damn it, this fellic is from Jerosa's Guild of Magic. If we were to trace it all the way back and his teacher is Andoin, that old fellow's from Jerosa's too. After recovering from his shock, Jirian immediately started happily picturing what he could boast about in the future. A legendary mage at the age of twenty? None of the geniuses that the guilds of magic and felon boast about can measure up to him. While the old fatty Jirian was happily thinking about everything he could boast about, the others in the Tower of Dusk saw hope. They saw how wonderful the future of the Tower of Dusk could be. A good background and backing were important in every occupation, and if one's boss was influential, then they would be able to enjoy the benefits of it too, but if one's boss was lacking, then there was a limit to how far one could go as well. Legendary, legendary realm indeed. Gavin initially only joined the Guild of Magic because of Mr. Basil's request, and he was ambitious too. He had thought about taking over after seeing that Linley was so young, but after seeing how Linley dealt with the sire bandits, this thought had been banished. The fact that the president was now a legendary mage did not only concern him. The Malfa family was able to flourish because they had a legendary mage. The Tower of Dusk had only been established not long ago, and they had thought that they would have to work incredibly hard for a long time before they could enjoy some fame. Now that their president was a legendary mage, it would not only serve as deterrence to others, but also attract many mages who wished to receive some guidance from a legendary mage even at the expense of paying for it. Gavin was elated and thankful at the same time, thankful because he had been discerning and did not leave a bad impression on the president and elated because the reputation of the Tower of Dusk would be better now that the president was a legendary mage. Since he was the president's right-hand man, his status would also rise accordingly. Mr. Basel was said to join as the head referee too, and then, once the Tower of Dusk had two legendary mages leading them, who would dare belittle them. Gavin was still an ambitious man, except that now, his ambition had become motivation for him to help the president manage the Guild of Magic well instead of vying for the president's spot. When the Guild of Magic became more influential, so would he as the right-hand man of the president. The other mages of the Tower of Dusk were all thinking about the same thing as Gavin as they all knew that having a legendary mage in the organization made a world of difference. No matter how powerful an organization was, if it lacked a legendary powerhouse, then it would always seem to be lacking in foundation as though it might fall any time. The mages of the Malfa family finally understood why Hutton had emphasized time and again not to come into conflict with the people of the Tower of Dusk. They had thought that the Malfa family had a legendary mage backing them, and thus they did not care much for a newly established guild of magic. Now, however, they realized that the Tower of Dusk also had a legendary mage, and a young one of only twenty years old at that. Nobody could say for sure whether they would become an archmage or a legendary mage or a sanctuary master. However, it was almost certain for a twenty years old legendary mage to become a sanctuary master as all he needed was time. After all, the god of mages Jeresco had received top-notch education when he was younger, yet he had only become a legendary mage at thirty years old. The mages of the Malfa family stared at the mages of the Tower of Dusk with envy and a tinge of awe. Nothing was perfect in the world, and even though the alchemy colossuses were so powerful that even Linley would have a hard time going against them, he was an alchemy guru who knew everything there was to know about the alchemy colossus. There was no need to go head-on against them. Linley immediately flew towards the four alchemy colossuses after he finished making the disintegrating array instrument. It was tedious to make an alchemy colossus, because it was very time-consuming and that was not considering the various magical ingredients that were needed. It would be much easier to just steal them, especially since he did not have to disintegrate all the alchemy arrays on the alchemy colossuses, since he could just use the disintegrating array to disintegrate some of the core ones for the machine to become useless. Given that Linley was an alchemy guru, it was all too easy for him to locate the core arrays on an alchemy colossus body. Damn it, this was good stuff. Even though there were flaws in the arrangement of the alchemy arrays, it would save him a lot of time compared to actually building one. He could just modify it a bit, and maybe it would reach the legendary level. Then, he would have another trump card he could use. Linley held the disintegrating array instrument in his hand, already regarding the four alchemy colossuses as his new possession. These four alchemy colossuses could be controlled by any magic shooter, 
and if he could have four nearly legendary level alchemy colossuses to help him in battles, then they would definitely be a treasure of the Tower of Dusk. Everyone's attention was on Lin Li as they wondered how this young legendary mage was going to turn the tables around. Some of them thought that a legendary mage would easily capture the alchemy colossuses, but others were worried that he would not be able to do so, since even legendary mages differed from each other. While Lin Li was definitely a legendary mage, he was only twenty years old, and surely he must have only been in the legendary realm for a short while. It was worrying to think about how he was going to face four alchemy colossuses which were comparable to a legendary magical beast each. Even the enemy had stopped as the ten archmages hovered in the air, holding their magic staffs tightly in their hands as they anxiously watched Lin Li. The wide brim of their hats hid their expressions from the others, but if one were to look closely, they would notice that they were slightly trembling, and their hands were white from gripping their magic staffs too tightly. They had not thought that their opponent had a legendary mage, and nobody could ignore the strength of a legendary mage. The four alchemy colossuses stood in a straight line beneath the ten archmages as the alchemy arrays shone on their bodies. Each machine was controlled by a human, after all, and even though their alchemy colossuses were almost as powerful as a legendary magical beast each, the person controlling it was only an average magic shooter of about level 14, or maybe they had just reached level 10. The fear of a legendary powerhouse was deeply ingrained in their souls, something that they would not forget even though they were sitting inside an alchemy colossus. The whole battlefield became quiet, and even the injured had forgotten their moans of pain. Everyone's attention was on the young man, the president of the Breezy Plains Guild of Magic, the owner of the Tower of Dusk, and the twenty-years-old legendary mage. The legendary realm meant that anyone who attained that level could become a legend in Amrel, leaving their awe-inspiring story behind for others. Everyone present, no matter which side they were on, had to admit that Lin Li was indeed a legend amongst the legendary. After the initial shock, however, Lin Li's age made everyone's fear of a legendary powerhouse lessen in this case. He was only twenty years old, and even if he was born in Legendary Realm, then it would only mean that he had been in the Legendary Realm for only twenty years, not like that was possible. Sendros completely disregarded Cheyenne who was from the Malfa family even though they were both Legendary Mages, because Cheyenne had only been in the Legendary Realm for a few decades, while Sendros was much more experienced. If the ten Archmages ran into a Legendary Mage as experienced as Sendros, they would definitely run as far away as they could, or perhaps they would not be able to run at all. However, since they were facing a newbie legendary mage, and they also had four alchemy colossuses, which were comparable to a legendary magical beast, nobody could say for sure who would win. Hence, even after the shock, the people on both sides did not think that this legendary mage could really turn the tides of the battle. The ten archmages hovering in the air exchanged a look with their leader not needing any words based on the chemistry they had developed over the years. They raised their magic staffs in front of their chest almost at the same time, and the magical crystals on their magic staffs started glowing with a faint light as they chanted. The four alchemy colossuses also raised their arms and aimed them at Linley, the alchemy arrays on their arms lighting up one by one as mana was channeled into them. The ten archmages and the four alchemy colossuses all aimed at Linley, waiting for him to approach before they'd strike quickly. Maybe it would not be a fatal blow, but it would definitely show the opponent that even a legendary mage would not fare much better against them. As Linley flew closer and they were getting ready to release their magic, they suddenly heard Linley chant. They were in shock, but they could not stop their magic spells either, and thus an avalanche of magic was hurled at Linley. A flurry of magic rained down on Linley as though he was at the bottom of a funnel. Yet, none of those spells, be it ice, fire, wind, or lightning elements, and no matter how powerful they were, could approach within half a meter of Linley. They could not see what was blocking the spells, as the latter seemed to dissipate naturally. Element Annihilation, some people exclaimed in shock at the sight. Element Annihilation was not a foreign magic to mages, more accurately, it was not usually in the form of magic that most mages knew it, since it was usually used in magewiths. The element annihilation worked as its name suggested, eliminating the effect of magic within a certain area. In places where mages practiced magic or dueled, 
element annihilation magewebs were often used to prevent damage to the buildings. While this magic was commonly seen, it was hardly used in the form of spells, as the chants were difficult even for a legendary mage. There were many archmages present, and the ten archmages from the sire bandits were close to the legendary realm, so while they did not know how to use this magic, they definitely had a deeper understanding of it than others. Seeing that their magic had no effect on the opponent at all, the black-robed archmages all had a look of shock on their faces. They were aware just how difficult this magic was as even the difficulty in casting the spell would place it in the top ten most difficult spells amongst all the spells in Amril. The unusually long and complicated chant was not the main reason why this was such a difficult spell, the truly intimidating thing about it was its ridiculous elemental structure. This meant that more mental strength had to be devoted to it, and it required more mental strength than an average legendary mage had. This element annihilation spell was forcefully converted from the field of inscription, and that resulted in the difficulty of casting it. It was like linguistic translation, while it only took one word to describe something in one language, it might require a few words to describe it in other languages. One had to have an incredible understanding of the element structure in order to use the spell, and understanding the element structure of an element annihilation spell would require a deep understanding of the study of magewefs. Linley did not lack mental strength, and he had devoted a lot of time and effort to understand element structures. On top of it all, he was also a guru in magewefs, hence, the element annihilation spell was really nothing particularly difficult for him. What were they to do now? No matter what spell the black-robed archmages used, they could not cause any harm to Linley at all. If he had used a magical shield of sorts, he might become dizzy due to the impact of the explosions, but due to the element annihilation, the magic dissipated even before it had the chance to do anything. They could only curse at him silently while they watched Linley fly towards the alchemy, colossuses on the ground. Someone could not help but ask, what is he trying to do? It was something everyone wanted to know as well. This was because the element annihilation prevented the user from casting spells aside from rendering other spells harmless. This was the reason why the spell version of the element annihilation was not highly regarded by people, and thus nobody thought to improve on it. Could it be that they are luring us to attack the alchemy colossuses? Do they take us for idiots? Whoever saw this scenario all thought like that. Since they did not have the strength to fight, they would use themselves as bait and lure the firepower of others to attack. The archmages donning black robes in the sky continuously attacked Linley with spells, but they simply could not land any hit on Linley. There was always a point where magic would lose its effectiveness, they were just waiting for the point when element annihilation gave out. The spellcasting standards of these ten archmages were decent. No matter how Linley maneuvered around those four alchemy colossuses, not a single spell had landed on the alchemy colossus's bodies. A legendary mage's power of flight was much better than an archmage's levitation spell, be it in terms of speed or maneuverability. If the levitation spell was like a balloon in the sky, then the power of flight was truly like a bird, soaring as it pleased. Linley only took a short pause of one to two seconds, beside every alchemy colossus. He would smack the alchemy colossus on the spot where the core arrays were located after the disintegrating array instrument in his hands had been activated. Soon, the four alchemy colossuses fell to his machinations, and as luck would have it, the power of the element annihilation was about to disappear. It's gone. The leader of the archmages in black robes had foreseen this moment. He hastened the spellcasting with a shout. Yet at this point, something weird happened. Screeching scraping could be heard from within the four alchemy colossuses. The complicated alchemy arrays on their bodies gave off a dazzling radiance, which was followed by flickering lights. Those that could lit up numbered less and less, until they finally all darkened completely. The four alchemy colossuses that had stronger combat prowess than legendary magical beasts had suddenly broken down for no rhyme or reason under everyone's shocked gaze. Nobody knew what happened to the alchemy colossuses, they only knew that the change had to be caused by that young legendary mage. The covers on the backs of the alchemy colossuses opened up, and the operators inside jumped out with panicked looks. One of the archmages descended closer and interrogated one of them furiously 
but the answer he got was full of confusion. Even a driver might not know how to repair a car, what more a high-end machinery like the Alchemy Colossus. Although the Kingdom of Rotterdam was known as the best in alchemy in the whole Anril, those that knew how to build an alchemy colossus were very few. High-level alchemists were like national treasures in Rotterdam. A loss of even one of them would cause tremendous heartache for the king of Rotterdam, so how could they come to such a place? The mages of the Tower of Dusk looked at their own president with worship. Although nobody had doubted the president's abilities before, they did not imagine that these four alchemy colossuses would be disabled without a fierce fight. With such an omnipotent president, the Tower of Dusk needed not worry about prosperity, and the members needed not worry about advancing. Truth be told, the principles of right and wrong, or good and evil, were all empty. They did not have any meaning at all. How could something like having one's cake and eating it too exist in this world? Humans were superficial animals, it was very normal for them to work, for whoever offered the most gains. To rope them in, the most important thing was to give them enough of the gains that moved them the most. Money, fame, future. They were all gains. If the Tower of Dusk did not give the people hope, these people would not have a sense of belonging after joining even with Basil's help. They would not treat the Tower of Dusk as an organization they were willing to work for. If it was just about throwing money, the relationships maintained by money was still weak. But now, a legendary powerhouse, a president that could create miracles, had shown them hope. It was inconceivable from the other's perspective, but Linley did not think it was anything special. Since he had the key to the door, why would he need to spend energy to smash the lock? This was what one thing goes with another meant, just like how spiced water went with bean curd. One disintegrating array had easily removed four alchemy colossuses from the equation. Are we still fighting? The archmages in black robes were hesitating. The four alchemy colossuses were their biggest reliance when they dared to take action against the legendary mage. Although they no longer had the four alchemy colossuses, they still thought that they would not lose if the ten of them worked together. However, it was unclear how many of these ten would survive. Furthermore, excluding this young legendary mage, the other opponents were not weak, either. Few humans were not afraid of death. The higher they stood, the more they feared losing it all. In Anril, legendary and sanctuary realm, powerhouses were rare. Archmages could be considered the peak of the profession of mages. A level 18 mage received respect, no matter which faction they belonged to. Nobody would be willing to lose all of this. Humph, we'll settle the score another day. The leader of the mages in black robes harshly left these words and turned around, wanting to lead his comrades away. After all, he was an archmage, so he could not throw his face away even when facing a legendary powerhouse. It's finally ending. The members of the Tower of Dusk and Malfa family let out a sigh of relief at the same time when they heard the enemy's words. After all, their enemies were ten level eighteen archmages. Chasing them away was already enough. If they were to fight to the death with them, at least half of the allies would perish with them even if they had a legendary powerhouse on their side. Another day? Linley rubbed his nose. Let's wait for after if asterisk ck you guys. Linley still remembered that no matter if it was the arm of the immortal king or the mysterious magical weapon, they were all not the reason he came here. The real motive for the members of the Tower of Dusk and himself to come here was to seek revenge for those that died at Black Cloud's town. Hence, be it the leftovers of the Sire Bandits or the ten archmages in front of him that came from another faction, none of them could be let off. Few people had seen a legendary mage take action in their lives before. Even if it was the mages from the Malfa family, they rarely saw Master Cheyenne take the field. Of course, it was needless to say that he was mobilizing against another legendary mage. But from this point of view, these ten archmages were considered lucky to be going against Linley. Black Cloud's town's disaster had definitely provoked Linley. For Linley, a maniac that protected short relationships, it was intolerable if anyone that had a friendly relationship with him before was hurt. The Merlin family had hurt McGren, and thus old Merlin and Grenville died. The whole Merlin family had completely fallen, reduced to an inferior force in Jerosis. 
Granger had hurt Orin, and so Granger's fate had long been decided, it was useless even when Aldwin took action to stop it. Now, the Sire Bandits and this mysterious faction had harmed the townspeople of Black Cloud's town. Then, they were not far from death, Linley mobilized all his might. He did not consider giving the opposition any chance, he instantly deployed the magical domain he'd grasped. Not only were they fighting a legendary mage, they even had the chance to experience a legendary mage's magical domain. The luck of these ten archmages was at the extreme. Oh God, it's a magical domain. The members of the Tower of Dusk looked on with excitement. Originally, they thought it was extraordinary that the President had stepped into the legendary realm. They did not think that the President had actually already grasped the magical domain. This was hardly something that a mage that had just stepped into the legendary realm could do. F asterisk CK, I really need a strong heart when I'm with this little bastard, Jirian said while staring blankly into the sky. Of all the people present, nobody had a deeper impression of Lin Li's demonic talent than him. When they first met, Lin Li was only a little level 8 mage, and how much time had passed since? He is only 20. Hutton's face was rather downcast. This was the second time he had seen Lin Li's magical domain. The previous time was in the abyss of Tharlan. Every time, this would make him feel depressed. In the past, he was a genius that was well known by everyone in the breezy plains, but now he felt that this title of genius was a joke. The current feelings of the magicians of the Malfa family were extremely complicated. Their sense of superiority had already been obliterated. It was especially so for that archmage called Yerik. Initially, he'd been rude to Linley and Hutton, before he actually realized that the opponent was actually a legendary powerhouse, and had even grasped the magical domain. This was simply too crazy. Everyone present was a mage, everyone knew what a magical domain meant for mages. It was the peak power of magic. It was a small world, and he was the god of that world, only with the magical domain was one a true legendary powerhouse. The sky that had been originally clear and cloudless was instantly filled with thunder clouds. Pure white snowflakes fell and instantly changed the small space into a snowy world. The snowflakes were fine and closely woven, causing the whole space to look like fog appeared. The sky and the earth was dyed a silvery white color. The plants that had been covered by the domain had been turned into ice sculptures, and after that, crisp shattering sounds filled the place. Similarly, although the mages from the Tower of Dusk and the Maltha family that were in this snowy world did not feel cold at all, and the snowflakes did not land on their bodies, the power of the domain still made them shiver. Even though they knew that the legendary mage in the sky with a blurry silhouette was on their side, the pressure produced by this display of peak magical strength still made everyone feel fear from the bottom of their hearts. In an instant, the earth gained a thick layer of silver makeup. That thick layer of snow seemed like it had a life of its own, it looked like the surface of a raging silver sea when it tossed and squirmed. A frost magical beast was formed every time a wave surged. All of them soared and charged towards those ten archmages wearing black robes, no matter if their original forms had the ability to fly. It's the Frost Domain. The leader of the archmages let out a sigh of relief when he saw the form. Although they were only archmages, and did not have their own magical domain, they still knew how it worked. After all, they were level 18 archmages, so it could be said that they were very close to the legendary realm. It was not weird for them to know about the magical domain. Rules formed domains. The frost domain was naturally formed by the laws of ice, and the laws of ice were not complicated. When a mage learned magic, a large number of spells that they came in contact with had the ice attribute, from the most basic icicle to the thousand miles of ice later. Through learning these spells, mages would gain a very good understanding of the laws of ice. This was why many mages would use the laws of ice as the foundation to create their own magical domain after entering the legendary realm. The reason for its being popularized was because the laws of ice were derived from the rules of water element, and were not fundamental rules that constructed an element. In terms of understanding and mastery, the laws of ice were naturally much easier. Magical domains that were made from simple rules could only be described as simple and low-level. The prowess of such a magical domain was imaginable. 
Hence, smart, legendary mages would not choose a single law as a vice magical domain. Seeing that it was the frost domain, the ten archmages in black robes felt hope reignited in their heart. After all, Linley was still a young legendary mage. It was not impossible to break through the domain with the strength of their ten. They huddled tightly together and descended to the ground as standing on the ground could at least reduce by one the directions they were attacked from. The magic staffs in their hands waved constantly, and every spell destroyed the frost magical beasts that were surging forward. After that, the snow petals in the sky stopped floating down, and refusing to gather in midair when they thought that they had seen hope. In an instant, hundreds of humanoids with black and white wings on their backs that were wielding spears and swords appeared beside the legendary mage. God, what is that? You know what I felt? The spectators on the ground once again issued some surprised sounds because they felt that it was too incredible and appalling. God, could you let us rest our weak hearts for a bit? Do you still want to let us live? If he was a legendary mage, then so be it. He actually also had magical domain. If it was the magical domain, then so be it, but it was actually a magical domain of the laws of ice. But then. Light and darkness. The mages of the Tower of Dusk and the Malfa family shouted in their hearts. The wave after wave of excitement was simply unbearable. The ten archmages that were surrounded by the frost magical beasts now had expressions of despair and horror. They felt an aura of the laws of light and darkness on some of the bodies of those humanoids, with black and white wings. Within the frost domain, they still had some chance with their abilities, but the appearance of the laws of light and darkness made them completely lose hope. Earth, fire, water, wind, light, darkness, and chaos were the seven fundamental elements that made up this world. Every element represented a set of fundamental rules. As compared to the simple laws like the laws of ice derived from the laws of the water element, every single fundamental element's rules were the hardest to master. It was especially so for light, darkness, and chaos. These three were the hardest to master. With the abilities of these ten archmages in black robes, it was not impossible to completely see through the abilities of the legendary mage, Linley. But after seeing this magical domain made from three rules, their hearts already had an answer that gave them despair. Level 20 would be called legendary. Level 21 could master the laws of ice and create the frost domain. Then what about controlling the ice, light, and darkness, these three rules? Those abilities should be at level 22 or 23. If you're enjoying my content, please consider donating a coffee. Or checking out my shirts on Tee Public. How could they have known that although Linley created the frost, light, and darkness magical domain, the rules that he really mastered comprised only the laws of ice? The usage of both the laws of light and darkness was based on the help from the two pieces of debris of the stars, holy light and gloomy dark. Otherwise, there was no way to master such unbelievable fundamental rules. Under the gaze of the archmages in black robes filled with despair and horror, Linley pointed the magic staff in his hand forward in their direction, just like the flag of a general commanding thousands of troops. The hovering angels of light and dark surrounding him moved out when they received the command. They spread open their large black and white wings, breaking through the snow-filled sky, and charged towards the enemy. The ten archmages in black robes could barely make it while facing the frost magical beasts that were surging forth just now, and thus they'd had a bit of hope that they could escape in the end. But now, although these angels of light and dark looked weak on the surface, being constructed by the laws of light and darkness, they were the strongest magical beings in the magical domain. Within the magical domain, every angel of light and dark had the power of at least level 18. As long as Linley's mana was not exhausted, their strength would not weaken a single bit. Shrieks echoed, and then stopped abruptly. Under the siege of the angels of light and dark, the ten archmages did not have a chance to hold on. They were archmages, and level 18 archmages in Anril were already at the peak of the mage profession, yet this time, they did not have a chance to retaliate while their bodies were within the frost, light, and darkness magical domain and facing the onslaught of the angels of light and dark. From afar, the angels of light and dark danced around while wielding their spears just like a group of predators hunting their prey. 
The archmages that had originally been overwhelmingly arrogant occasionally showed a complexion full of fear and despair. The mages of the Tower of Dusk and the Malfa family felt a chill in their hearts. This was the difference between an archmage and a legendary mage. Before anyone noticed, it stopped snowing. The dark clouds in the sky dissipated at a speed that could be seen with the naked eye. The silhouettes of the angels of light and dark started to become more transparent until they totally disappeared. What was left on the ground were the ten archmages in black robes that had been completely frozen solid as though their bodies were encapsulated in ice coffins, and the fear on their faces could be seen clearly. The piled-up snow on the ground quickly melted, and quickly became a stream that flowed off towards the lower grounds. H has it ended? J just like that? Yarek swallowed his saliva with difficulty. What sort of person had he offended? The impressive enemy archmages had actually been toppled so easily. Furthermore, it was like a pounce of a beast. Please, those were level 18 archmages. Although they were not as rare as legendary mages, in the whole Felon Kingdom and Anrel, level 18 archmages were not plenty. Clean up the battlefield. Linley descended slowly to the ground from the air and gave a reminder to those mages that were in a daze. The mages of the Tower of Dusk immediately cheered with excitement. In the past two months or so, even though there were no casualties under the leadership of Jirion, it was too suffocating to be constantly pressured by the enemies. However, the president was actually a legendary mage, and he had the magical domain. Great! The grudge in their hearts dissipated along with the enemy's defeat. F asterisk CK, how could you kill them? We still do not know where they are from. At this point, only a thoughtless person like Jirion would dare to speak to Linley in this manner. Everyone else looked at Linley with a face full of respect. Walking, Linley chuckled and said, Relax, how could I forget this? There are three survivors there. Three? Why did you leave so many? These fellas aren't easy to control, Jirion said with a frown. After all, they were level 18 archmages. It was not easy to take, and keep, them prisoner if there were no tricks involved. Naturally, there was a reason behind my leaving three of them, Linley did not say much, nor did he refute Jirion, because Linley knew that Jirion's worries were reasonable. When dealing with warriors, solid shackles would cause them to lose all strength, to resist, breaking some limbs, to be a little more cruel, would also do the job. However, mages could still use some spells to create quite a bit of trouble even if they could not make any noise. Furthermore, it was three level 18 archmages they were talking about here. If they were to use some tricks, an average person would not be able to take it. The ice coffins melted quickly and revealed the enemies that were frozen solid. As expected, the seven that died could not be any more dead, and there were three that were still breathing weakly. Linley walked to the front of those archmages that were still unconscious, murmuring incantations. The magical crystal at the tip of the magic staff, before his face radiated, following the casting of the spell. After that, Linley gently knocked the magic staff on the forehead of an archmage. The radiance of the magical crystal on the tip of the magic staff converged, as though it had been knocked into the brains of the other party. Oh, that archmage slowly regained consciousness. He immediately panicked as he saw the situation in front of him, retreating backwards while still on the ground. However, he just moved two to three meters, and he felt his back hitting something. Raising his head to take a look, he noticed the mages of the Tower of Dusk were grinning at him with their teeth shown. The two mages of the Tower of Dusk immediately kicked the prisoner down and tied him up with a rope. Ah, uh, my, my mana! The archmage instinctively wanted to resist but he realized at this point that there was a barrier blocking and not allowing him to feel a shred of mana no matter how he used his mental strength, just as though he had become an average person. Actually, the method to limit a mage's spell-casting abilities had become the topic of research for many. It was indeed not a simple issue to completely suppress a mage's powers, especially under the premise of not harming the mage. Taking a mage prisoner and preventing him from escaping the whole day. Furthermore, they could not be humiliated or mistreated under the tacitly accepted law of Anrel. They could only be treated with good food and wait for the opposition they belonged to pay the ransom. It was too aggrieving to be a victor. 
hence, there was this mana shackle spell. However, one had to have a deep understanding of the rules of magic in order to seal a mage's spell casting ability. It was only legendary mages that grasped the magic rules and created the magical domain that had the ability to cast the mana shackle spell. Upon hearing the screams of the archmage, the onlooking mages of the Tower of Dusk and the Maltha family did not show much surprise on their faces. Although it was harder to seal a mage's ability to cast spells than to kill the mage, that young president was a legendary mage. However, their calm expressions changed quickly. The mages in the area were so shocked that their mouths did not know how to close anymore after Linley sealed the mana of the other two archmage prisoners. Even if he was still a legendary mage, it should be impossible to single-handedly seal the mana of three archmages. Was he still human? There were three essential factors when mages cast spells, mental strength, mana, and the structure of elemental sequencing, but the most fundamental one was still mental strength. Adjusting mana when casting spells and sequencing elemental structure both had to go through mental strength. Mana increased with levels, and the elemental structure sequencing was perfected through practice, but it was widely believed that everyone had a fixed amount of mental strength, there was almost no way to practice and increase it. Hence, the strength of the mental strength basically determined a mage's potential for development. All of the mages present knew that this spell, Mana Shackle, was said to shackle a mage's mana, but in actual fact, it was sealing mental strength to cause a mage to be unable to adjust mana. Hence, this spell did not require much mana, but the required mental strength was extremely large. At the same time, the more mental strength the user employed, the stronger the effects of this shackle. Under the premise of not affecting one's own body, an established legendary mage could only shackle one archmage. If two archmages were shackled by him, his body not only would not be able to unleash powers at the legendary level, but he could even fall off from the legendary realm accidentally. After all, it was hard to recover from damage to mental strength. Three level 18 archmages had actually had their ability to cast spells sealed, and yet the young president looked like he had just done something trivial. There was not a single sign of mental exhaustion. Everyone was silent, they even did not dare to look squarely at Linley. They only dared to size him up from the side sneakily, just how strong this young legendary mage president was. How would they know that Linley was simply a mental strength monster? When compared to that vast mental strength, the mental strength used to shackle the three archmages was simply like a drop of water in the sea. Yet, it was this drop of mental strength that made other legendary mages, or even sanctuary masters, unable to dispel the shackles he cast. Linley shackled the mana of the three archmages and caused them to lose the ability to cast spells. He waved his hands to get his subordinates to lock up the three of them. Once they sensed something abnormal in their bodies, the three archmages' faces immediately turned pale, and they lost all thoughts of trying to escape. There was actually nothing much to clean up on the battlefield. All there was to do was to treat the injured allies and finish off the injured enemies while gathering the bodies of the fallen allies to be brought back and burning the corpses of the dead enemies. As for the spoils of war, there were still items on those few archmages other than the four alchemy colossuses that Linley had disabled. The pockets of the rest were cleaner than their faces. Hutton stood next to the bodies of those from the Malfa family, he looked at them with heartache. These were all elites of the family, and each of them had a significant value. Originally, he'd thought that this was a sideshow. He had not thought that the enemies they encountered were going to be so strong. He only hoped that the Malfa family would be on good terms with the Tower of Dusk through this incident. In that case, these deaths would not be in vain. Seeing the bodies being collected, Hutton spoke to Yarrick and walked towards Linley to ask what was their next move. However, he only took two steps and felt something was wrong. He turned round and saw that Yarrick was still standing at the same spot with an expression of biting his tongue. Seeing that expression of his, why would Hutton not know what he was worried about? He thought, F asterisk CK, I already told you before that that President Felic and the Tower of Dusk should not be provoked. You just wouldn't F asterisk King listen. Now what, you're scared, right? Hutton actually felt some elation, and said, Yarrick, why are you in days? Follow me to look for President Felic and see what he plans next. 
Ah. Yes, yes, Yarrick's face was full of internal conflict. He slowly walked over to Hutton, and finally he could not help but say, Master Hutton, although I was being rude to President Felic previously, it was all for the Malfa family. You can't stand by and just watch me die. Yarrick, what are you saying? What's this about leaving you to your demise? Did you forget that I didn't remind you only once? You didn't want to heed my advice, so what else can I do? Hutton spoke with an innocent look. Master Hutton, it's my fault. Please, don't lower yourself to my level and help me out, Yarrick pleaded with an anxious look. No matter what, Yarrick was a level 17 archmage. Although he could not be compared to that monster Linley, he was still a talent. Hutton thought for a bit. He did not wish for the Malfa family to suffer any more losses, so he said, Okay, go apologize sincerely, and I will follow up for you. President Felic is a legendary mage, he shouldn't make a fuss with you. Although Yarrick was still ill at ease, it was better than doing nothing at all. He immediately nodded and walked over with Hutton. When he had just walked over, he rushed to the front and bent forwards at a 90-degree angle. His attitude was as sincere as it could get, he said that he was blind, that President Felic was magnanimous, and asked not to make a fuss, and so on. Although Linley tended to avenge grievances big and small, he still had to give some face to Hutton. They had come to help, and quite a few of them had perished. It was also still unclear if there were any spoils to find in the Sire Bandit's hideout. As a result, he benevolently waved his hands, and said to Hutton, Mage Hutton, after this battle, be it the remnants of the Sire Bandits or the mysterious organization supporting them, I believe the main force is no longer here. From here on, I plan to attack the Sire Bandits' hideout immediately. Think about it. Currently, it was sufficient to take down the Sire Bandits' nest with just the strength of the Tower of Dusk. Their hideout might even be empty. However, after this battle, the loot so far was not enough. The Malfa family had losses there, so Linley was rather embarrassed to just send off Hutton and the rest empty-handed. More importantly, he could not bear to give the alchemy colossuses to the Malfa family, so he thought that it was impossible not to find some good items within the Sire Bandit's hideout to send off Hutton with. Linley did not specifically mention forgiving Yarrick, but since he talked about cooperating for the next plan, it also meant that he would not look into it any more. Yarrick finally settled down his anxious heart and stood up straight beside Hutton, listening obediently to their conversation and turning a blind eye to the gazes of the other members of the Tower of Dusk. Seeing that Lanley did not make a fuss about Yarrick's rudeness previously, Hutton also let out a sigh of relief. If Lanley wanted to look into it no matter what, he could only sacrifice Yarrick for the sake of the relationship between the two factions. He also sensibly did not mention anything about it. As for Linley's next plan, he said, we will follow President Felix's arrangements. The Sire Bandits have been threatening the Breezy Plains for a long period of time and committed countless murders and arson. Being able to eradicate them completely this time, we of the Malfa family will not shirk responsibility in order for the Breezy Plains to gain some peace. There was not a single shred of embarrassment on Hutton's face as he launched his righteous spiel. This fella had been in contact with Linley for a while, and he spoke whatever came to his mind, completely forgetting that the Malfa family and the Sire Bandits were in cahoots not too long ago. In order to prevent the leftover Sire Bandits in the hideout from escaping after they received the news of the battle's outcome, the force of the two factions had a short break before they gathered together and set forth for the hideout of the Sire Bandits. During the journey, not a single other person was seen. It did not take long before they reached the entrance of the gorge where the Sire Bandit's hideout was located. A few lines of defense at the front seemed not to have been used again after Jirion brought men to destroy them. The front gates of the Sire Bandit's base were tightly shut. The gates that were made of wood only had two old bandits dozing off on top. Without Linley's command, a spell blew open the gates and shocked the two old bandits till they almost fell off the gates. When they saw the mages charging over, they immediately panicked and started screaming and sounding the gongs. However, almost all of the bandits on this mountain had already been defeated. Even if the two old bandits were to break apart the gongs, only a sparse group of ten to twenty weak, old, 
and frail bandits would come out. Only a few remained standing with a single spell shot over. They thought that attacking the sire bandits' hideout would be easy, but they did not think that it would be this easy. A single spell blasted the gates apart, and another struck the bandits down. This was all it took to take down the hideout. These bandits left as guards did not have any value, and thus Lin Li did not let his underlings take prisoners. After that, the members of the two factions started to clear out the estate until not a single bandit was left. In the storage of the sire bandits, other than rations, there were weapons and armor of inferior quality. With a single look, it was clear that they were equipment given to the average bandit. However, everyone had the habit of hiding valuables. As the boss of the sire bandits, how could Vanscore not have a treasure vault of his own? Search carefully, do not leave out a single corner. The sire bandits had been rampant in the breezy plains for several years. The savings of this bandit, Vanscore, should not be too shabby. Indeed, within a short period, somebody came to Linley and Hutton and said that a tunnel was found. Linley generously invited Hutton to take a look together. He even said that the Malfa family were guests and they should pick their spoils of war first. It made Hutton so touched that he was speechless. Actually, Hutton's objective this time was to build up a good relationship with this young legendary mage. As for any material benefits, they were originally not within the scope of his consideration. It could be said that even if Linley were to send them off now, Hutton would not have a single grudge. Furthermore, from Hutton's point of view, the four alchemy colossuses and the ten level 18 archmages were defeated by President Felix single-handedly. Even if President Felix did not give him any benefits, it would be normal. To receive rewards based on the contribution was something very normal. But, President Felix did not intend on not sharing. He even allowed Hutton to go in together and let him choose the spoils of war. Hutton declined, but seeing Lin Li's determined attitude, he could only accept with gratitude. They walked in the tunnel in a single file and arrived in an underground warehouse. The surface area of the warehouse was large. It was not much smaller than the public warehouses outside. After exiting the tunnel, the first thing that came into view were large amounts of metal ingots arranged neatly. Naturally, those that were kept here were not normal metal, but something like shadow-forged siderite, winter iron, and flaming red copper. Although these materials did not amount to much in the eyes of Linley, the expression on Hutton's face was more interesting. It was not like Hutton had not seen these things, but, after all, the value was still there. This large amount of wealth was enough to stuff the mouths of those old men. However, this was just a small portion of the goods in the warehouse. Behind the magical metals, there was another pile of valuable lumber used for making magic staffs. Hutton was almost dazzled by what he saw. There were rainbow sycamore, sunset wood, crystal wood, etc. Each and every one were polished semi-completed products. Afterward, there were several specimens of flora. They were all herbs that had been semi-processed crudely. These attracted Lin Li's attention. His recent source of income was the potion industry. As it happened, getting these herbs would be able to save him a lot of trouble. As they ventured deeper, the completed magical weapons, armor, magic robes, and magic staffs all had a rather powerful magical wave. Who knew how many merchants Vanscor had robbed that he actually had so many good items? When compared to those items to the front, the wooden crates filled with gold coins stacked up in the corner did not have as much allure to the audience. Check all items in detail, Linley said to Gavin, then he turned his head, and asked, Mage Hutton, ask your men to check as well. No, 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 there's no need. I trust President Felic. Hutton promptly waved his hand while speaking. If he were to take the kind words of others seriously, then he would be an idiot. Linley smiled while saying, Don't misunderstand, Mage Hutton. There's so many items here. We can't finish checking if it's just the people from the Tower of Dusk. It's better if we do it together. Hutton saw that Lin Li's expression was sincere, so he calmed his perturbed feelings and nodded as he said, Okay then. The members of the two factions checked everything together and quickly finished checking the little vault of Vanscore. They took the inventory list above and passed it to Lin Li and Hutton, who were conversing. 
since the items had been checked, then the next step would be the decision how to split them. How much would they receive? It wasn't just Hutton. The other members of the Malfa family were anxious as well at this point. After all, the facts were in front of them. The alchemy colossuses and the archmages were dealt with by the president of the Tower of Dusk. Some people from their side did die, but contribution was not based on the number of casualties. Lindley looked through the list once, and gently placed it on the table before saying, Mage Hutton, since the items have been checked, let's discuss the issue of distribution in order to conclude the matters early. I dare not. I will leave the distribution to you, President Felick. Hutton lowered his attitude extremely. After all, the other party was a legendary mage. There was nothing shameful about it. Lin Lee's finger knocked on the table gently, and he thought over it while looking at the list. He said, since Mage Hutton said so, then I'll take charge of the distribution. If Mage Hutton has any suggestions, please say it. After speaking, he looked through the list while going through the distribution method. First, it was magical metals. Linley did not have a lack of these items, and currently, he did not have any plans to earn money with blacksmithing. Hence, these were split evenly. It was the same for the magical lumber. After that, it was those herbs. These things were not useful to the Malfa family, so Linley simply took them all. To reimburse Hutton, most of the completed magical equipment was given to the Malfa family. After all, there was nothing of the highest quality, the best could not be compared to the sunset set that the mages of the Tower of Dusk wore. As for the armor and swords, of what use would they be to the Guild of Magic? Linley only saved one set for Sword Master, and the rest was given to the Malfa family. While listening to the distribution that Linley was drawing up, Hutton was constantly screaming in his heart. It's fake, right? I must be dreaming, it can't be real. Forget about Hutton, the others from the Malfa family that were qualified enough to enter did not dare to believe what they heard at this point. They looked at each other with eyes wide open, and the shock they felt was hard to miss on their faces. This young president is joking with us, right? Or does he really not know the value of those things? Hutton grew more cautious as he continued watching. This, 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 this is too fake, right? Who is this person in front of me? He's a miser that would pluck out a few feathers when a sparrow flew past him, so how could he be so generous, and how could he be willing to talk about brotherhood with me? F asterisk CK, this fella shouldn't be planning on trying to silence us by killing us, right? No, no, President Felick. This distribution would be too unfair for the Tower of Dusk. Although we, the Malfa family, are not wealthy, we do not do things such as taking advantage of our allies. Do you want to change the distribution method? God, what had happened to this world? Why was everyone so modest now? Most of the people present had seen profit sharing before, from the members of small adventurer groups to the big factions like the Malfa family. Be it on a personal scale or an organization scale, which of them were not flushed with agitation when it came to the discussion of profit sharing? Yet currently, one was giving the other party more, and the other was declining. No wonder everyone felt it was unbelievable. After all, they were not Hutton. How could they understand Hutton's current feelings? F asterisk CK. No matter how good these items were, they had to be brought back with their lives. A miser had suddenly become so generous, wouldn't you feel a chill down your spine? Then, why not do it this way? Lindley thought for a bit before he said, aren't there four alchemy colossuses left? If you, the Malfa family, do not have a high-level alchemist, or you are unable to employ the help of a high-level alchemist, then I will just keep the four alchemy colossuses. Then, this equipment would be the compensation for the Malfa family. Of course, of course, how could Hutton still refuse? Although he was envious of the alchemy colossuses, high-leveled alchemists were the national treasure of the Kingdom of Rotterdam. Although the Malfa family was considered one of the top two families in the Breezy Plains, it was basically impossible for them to hire one. Furthermore, the other party mentioning that he wanted the corpses of those alchemy, colossuses more or less, made Hutton no longer so worried. Why would Hutton be reluctant? 
Linley nodded his head, and then split the gold coins and the magical crystals equally. The home of Vanscore had basically been redistributed completely. The Malfa family was in a daze for a long while, before they realized how much they had earned. Everyone had a dreamy feeling, and they shouted in their hearts, President Felic is a good man. On the other hand, the members of the Tower of Dusk were not looking too good. They all looked at the members of the Malfa family with unkind gazes, and inwardly grumbled, what gives them the right? What did they contribute that allows them to have half of the spoils of war? President, Gavin spoke to Linley while standing up anxiously. Linley raised his hand and stopped Gavin from speaking. Enough. Stop talking, just distribute it all according to what I said. Gavin did not have anything else to add upon hearing the president saying so. He could only bring men to distribute the items unwillingly. While distributing the items, the Malfa family members felt their faces burning. When they fought for benefits with the other factions previously, they did not feel embarrassed when picking up the items after they managed to get more. However, now the other party took the initiative to give out more benefits, and they did not fight for it, why was it that they were so embarrassed to take them? Although they did not feel happy, the members of the Tower of Dusk still carried out the orders of the President, strictly. They were not friendly towards the members of the Malfa family, but they did not exploit them during the distribution of the items. The items were distributed quickly, and the matters at hand had been completed. The Sire Bandits, a cancer that had been wreaking havoc in the breezy plains for many years, had finally been completely wiped out today. Hutton was outside, commanding his men to move the spoils of war. There were only Linley and Jirian remaining in the hall of the hideout. Let me say this, this is definitely out of character for you. Why did you throw the items that you just received? Jirian asked Linley with an expression as though he was seeing a stranger. What else could it be about? It's to let them leave earlier. Otherwise, if there were anything good within the cave, are we supposed to split that as well? With Lin Li's current status, he really did not think much of those items. The items within the Throne of Darkness had not been taken out by him yet. How could Vanscore, a bandit, compare to the Lord of Darkness? Jirian snickered while saying, Hee hee, you're so sure that there's something good in the cave? If there isn't any, then I have nothing for you to cure your regret. Then what of it? If there's nothing in the cave, I have already gained enough just from obtaining those four alchemy colossuses. Linley was a little proud for a moment. Knowledge was power. He was an alchemy guru. Those four alchemy colossus would be decorations if given to the Malfa family. Only he could bring out their power. He then added, Oh yes, let's talk about what's going on with that cave. Based on my speculation, that cave has a high chance of being related to the High Elves. It might be some ruins of the High Elves, Jirian spoke softly as though he was trying to sound mysterious. High Elves again. What did you infer from that it has links to the High Elves? Linley did not believe it fully. The Dark Age had ended long ago, so how many more High Elves ruins could remain undiscovered? I'm not spouting nonsense, there's proof for it all. Jirian showed his dissatisfaction with Linley's doubts, and then he said, in my hands. There is a diary passed down from the Dark Age. Based on the owner's claims, he was the underling of the High Lord of the High Elves, Osric. Seeing that Jirian was not joking, Lin Li's expression started becoming serious. He thought, since Jirian has already said so, then the diary's age should have been confirmed. Since it has been passed down from the Dark Age, then the owner's identity should not be fake. Jirian, who was very satisfied with Lin Li's performance, laughed with pride. That diary mentioned a snippet of Osric's secret information. It said that when Osric was in his later years, he once used a whole magic legion to guard a transport of resources to the breezy plains secretly. Oh, do you know what he had been transporting? Lin Li asked, curiously. This? Haha. <laughs> Jirian scratched his head with embarrassment, and said, this diary didn't specify such details. Its owner speculated that it must have been a very valuable load of resources. Erm, isn't this nonsense? Since Osric could use a whole magic legion as guards, the contents must have been valuable. What else did that cliffhanging guy say? 
Evidently, Lindley was a little unsatisfied with this fella who'd written the diary. However, he also knew that in the Dark Age, this fella was considered a capable man to have some clues about things that a man as powerful as High Lord Osric did. Don't be so short-tempered, young man, I haven't finished speaking, said Jirian, taking out a notebook from his chest. He flipped a few pages, and said, although the owner of this diary didn't specify any details, according to information inferred, this bunch of resources was extremely likely to have been gathered to construct something. This diary in your hands, is that diary? Lindley was quite surprised. That diary was so new, and didn't even have any protective magical wave. Of course, not. If this were the one passed down from the Dark Age, even if there was magic as protection, it'd be impossible for it to be so new. I've only seen that diary a very long time ago. After realizing the unusualness of the cave upon coming here, I recalled this incident, and wrote down these things from memory. It's only for the ease of analysis. Look at it yourself, said Jirian as he threw the notebook in his hand to Linley. Magicians all had pretty good memory, but the reason Linley did not doubt the authenticity of this document at hand was not because of his faith in Jirian's memory, but the fact that nothing in this document was written with a certain tone. Rather, it was filled with speculative expressions like maybes, perhaps, and what ifs. This kind of thing wouldn't affect much, even if Jirian had remembered some things wrongly. Maybe he would even score a lucky hit. Building something? Lin Lee's fingers knocked on the table, producing soft tap-tap sounds. He was contemplating this issue in his heart. Honestly speaking, those high elves were too damn frustrating. Why couldn't they just vanish, without putting up a struggle, instead of using so many tricks, to torment people? Jirian laughed with pride. You see, even the materials used for construction were high-class goods escorted by the Magic Legion. How can the things stored inside be bad? That isn't impossible. Maybe Osric died even before it could be completed, so there's nothing much inside, Linley said jokingly. I have considered this problem too, but according to the timeline of the diary, this possibility can basically be eliminated, unless they were building something even bigger than Osric's mausoleum, said Jirian. Those things were transported to the breezy plains. Doesn't seem like it's about the scar of death. Other than the scar of death in the Blackstone Mountains, where else can things be hidden in the breezy plains? Looks like there's only the Dragon Mountains left, said Linley, as he looked at the information at hand. Let me tell you something. You probably haven't noticed that after we entered the mountain hideout of the remnants of the Sire Bandits to search it, but I discovered a few construction foundations deep in the heart of the hideout. Those foundations are probably pretty old, at least 300 to 500 years old, said Jirian, immensely proud of himself. The Sire Bandits were probably established no earlier than 100 years ago. Since there are such ancient building foundations in their hideout, seems like they are not the first ones to live there, said Linley indeed. I've asked Gavin and friends. They are all from the breezy plains and familiar with the history and environment here. They told me that before the Sire Bandits, there hasn't been any news that other bandits ever occupied this valley. Although no news doesn't mean there definitely hadn't been any, at least this fact made the place more suspicious. Speaking of this, it's indeed quite suspicious. There's no point in guessing, no matter what it is, we will know once we've seen it for ourselves. Linley couldn't be bothered to guess blindly. The cave was just at the base of the valley, anyway. Whether it was the remains of the high elf's constructions, or a magical beast's nest, he would know once he scouted the cave. Hutton didn't know why Linley and the fellas from the Tower of Dusk were still here, but he didn't dare to ask them. Seeing that he had no business here, he packed up and said goodbye to Linley. This certainly wasn't a wasted trip. Not only was he able to secure an even firmer relationship with the Tower of Dusk, he also acquired a large amount of rewards from the battle. Although there had been some casualties, the rewards were enough to shut those old codgers up. Hutton left with his men in satisfaction. Linley calculated for a while. As long as it was related to the High Elves, nothing was easy to deal with. It'd be better to explore the cave himself. Those from the Tower of Dusk weren't going to be of much help, either. Better for them to bring back the rewards first. No, I object. Why are you not bringing me along? 
we're talking about the High Elf's relics here. Jirian was displeased. This secret was discovered by him, yet he couldn't even see it. That little rascal was so exasperating. Linley had his reasons for thinking this way. Just speaking of those two pieces of debris of the stars, holy light and gloomy dark, he had, they were from the ruins of the High Elves. Which one of those ventures wasn't filled with dangers, ending with him barely making it back alive? If he were to encounter a crisis that even he couldn't overcome, so what if he brought along so many people? He would have to protect them eventually. Of course, for the sake of Jirian's ego, Linley couldn't tell him straight out that he was too weak and would hold Linley back. Therefore, Linley contemplated for a while and earnestly said, Actually, I feel so regretful that you can't accompany me, but there is a crucial matter concerning the development of the Tower of Dusk. I have no choice but to ask you to personally help with it. Oh, is that so? After hearing these words, Jirian got interested. He raised his eyebrow slightly and proudly said, Tell me what you need me to help with. Just say it. It's like this. This time, when Hutton from the Malfa family came, we also talked about the potion business other than dealing with those sire bandits. Basically, they wanted some quota, and I needed them to provide some cheap medicinal ingredients. So, we just briefly talked about collaboration. I'll need to trouble you to help settle the specifics. Linley didn't lie, speaking of business negotiation, nobody in the Tower of Dusk was talented in this aspect. Meanwhile, Jirian coincidentally had the potential of an unscrupulous merchant. If he took charge, the Tower of Dusk wouldn't suffer any loss no matter what happened. All right, I will settle this. Jirian thought for a while, knowing that Linley didn't lie to him. The Tower of Dusk primarily relied on the potion business to gain income they needed to survive. This matter naturally concerned the development of the Tower of Dusk as well. Since there was a proper matter to settle, it definitely took priority over exploration. Anyway, what lay in the cave at the base of the valley was still a mystery. Maybe it was the High Elf's ruins, but maybe it wasn't anything important. Linley also found it a little funny. It was just a speculation, could he really find the relics of the High Elves just by randomly walking around? However, to prevent any accidents, Linley still decided to settle the Tower of Dusk's matters before going there. The last time he went to the Abyss of Tharlan, three months passed unknowingly in the blink of an eye. If he encountered something this time too, then it would hold up things too much. Actually, there were not many matters to take care of. The potion business was left to Jirian, the chores in the Tower of Dusk were managed by Gavin. The only matter that Linley needed to settle personally was the issue of the pharmaceutics apprentices. In the beginning, there were two choices to this, one being to train their own people from the Tower of Dusk, the other being to borrow people from the pharmacist guild. However, a pharmacist trained from scratch wouldn't be able to do much in the short term, so the best option currently was to borrow apprentices from the pharmacist guild. Borrow people? No, wouldn't Linley owe them a favor if he did so? Linley wasn't someone willing to lose out. He dipped a pen in ink and wrote a letter to the Balba, the president of the pharmacist guild, choosing every word with care. Training entrustment? What does it mean? Since Linley did not have any intention to hide it, Jirian naturally impolitely looked over his shoulder, but what he saw was a big heading pharmacist training entrustment plan at the top of the letter. Linley didn't reply, so Jirian continued to read the letter, his eyes widening more as he read. In the letter to Balba, Linley didn't even mention the fact that he was short on manpower. Instead, he displayed a totally selfless and altruistic attitude and suggested a very thoughtful plan, the pharmacist training entrustment plan. Linley wrote thus. Concerned about the shortage of talents in Amril's pharmacist industry, I have decided to establish the entrusted pharmacist training class. The following details are for the reference of President Balba. Advanced pharmaceutics lessons will be taught in this class. Students need to be at least medium-tier pharmacists, and the duration of training is one year. No school fee is charged, food and housing needs to be settled on your end. After one year of training, at least half of the students are guaranteed to advance by a level. Places are limited. Register now. This. 
Felic, you are suffering such great loss, how can you not charge any school fees? Jirian couldn't react at that moment and was quite worried about Linley. Linley blew the ink dry and laughed. So you also think that I'm losing out? That's how it's supposed to be. If you're losing out, why did you even? Haha, <laughs> you are such a cunning lad. Jirian was also an old fox, and he figured out the trick behind this very fast. This lad was really a little fox, he thought. He obviously wanted people to do work for him, yet he didn't even have to pay them their wages and care about their food and housing in the name of training. What was more important was that not only would this avoid owing Balba a favor, but also make Balba a Linley one instead. Who knew what Balba's reaction would be after seeing this letter? Linley wasn't afraid that Balba would reject it. After all, this deal was beneficial to both Balba and the Pharmacist Guild. The reason behind using the pretext of a training entrustment was entirely due to his own wicked sense of humor. In addition, it was always good not to owe anyone favors. There was another reason, which was for those coming pharmacists to put down their pride from the start. Given the status of the pharmacists in Anril, even medium tier pharmacists were treated like masters by every faction wherever they went. However, Linley was summoning people for hard labor, and not for them to enjoy life like a master. So, given their status as students, who dare to act like a master? The next day, Jirian left with the people from the Tower of Dusk. That letter would be sent to Alana's pharmacist guild, into the hands of President Balba. If not for the fact that he needed to do business with the Malfa family, Jirian would have gone himself to see what Balba's expression would be after reading the letter. After the people left, Lichudge Falusi and Vampire Norfeller, who had been hiding nearby, came to Linley's side. Both of them had watched the battle yesterday from start to end, now, they looked at Linley with more admiration. Linley briefly told them the gist of the matter. These two undead henchmen certainly didn't have any objections. They followed along everywhere their master went. The cave that Jirian had mentioned was located deep in the valley. It was accidentally discovered when they prepared to attack the sire bandits from the back. Linley brought the two undead creatures into the cave, released a few warlock's eyes as he went exploring, and ventured further into the cave. Not knowing how long they had walked, Linley just felt that they had walked a very long way. It was good that there wasn't any fork in this cave, if not, he would think that he was going in circles. Using the illuminating spell to light up the surrounding walls, Linley was surprised to find no evidence of excavation. Could it be that this was just an ordinary cave formed by nature? Just as Linley was losing his patience from the long walk, pla, pla sound suddenly came from the darkness ahead, just as if something was flipping its wings. Before Linley could see it clearly with the warlock's eyes, that unknown creature somehow managed to deactivate the warlock's eyes. However, Linley didn't wait for long. Those pla, pla sounds ahead drew nearer, and the unknown creature finally appeared in front of his eyes. It was in fact a group of palm-sized black bats. Seeing the bats, Linley couldn't help but think of vampires. He turned and looked at Norfeller beside him. However, Norfeller looked quite tense at this moment. His eyes were fixed on the flying bat in front. Shaking his head, he said, they are not vampires, they are night. Night demon bats. These are the night demon bats? This was the first time Linley saw night demon bats with his own eyes, but he had heard many stories about them. Comment. Although night demon bats looked like incarnations of vampires, they were in fact not related to vampires at all. They were unable to take human form, and no matter how high level they were, they were always palm-sized. However, one shouldn't think that they were easy to deal with given their small size. Those bats could definitely make you die without burial ground. An adult night demon bat's individual ability typically reached level 17 to 19. A night demon bat king could likely reach legendary level. What was more important was that these magical beasts lived in groups. Even smaller groups consisted of about 30 of them. Thinking about it, 10 level 18 archmages could rival an ordinary legendary powerhouse, so what would it look like to fight with 30 of them? Even a legendary magical beast would avoid confronting a group of about 30 adult night demon bats. 
Night demon bats' favorite food was vampires, so wherever there were night demon bats, vampires certainly wouldn't get close. Even a legendary realm vampire wouldn't dare to provoke those night demon bats in groups. However, if a vampire was lucky enough to obtain the fresh blood of night demon bats, then it would be extremely beneficial for its personal growth and abilities. Linley looked at Norfeller. This vampire that was merely level 17 could do less for him by day. Since they had encountered the night demon bats this time, it could be considered an opportunity for Norfeller. Linley was never stingy towards his men, that group of night demon bats was close to 30. Their flight patterns appeared to be somewhat clumsy, wobbling from side to side as if they would fall to the ground or bump into the wall at any moment. However, with careful inspection, one would realize that when they moved forward, their bodies were shining. This shine wasn't referring to the brightness of the light, but the sparkle caused by the disappearing and reappearing of bodies. This was an inborn talent of the night demon bats, the ability to move between the shadow dimension and the main dimension, this was also their only way of moving around. Master, they are more interested in vampires. I will try my best to hold them up, please leave this place quickly, sir. When Norfeller identified the number of night demon bats, he didn't dare wishfully think of escaping anymore. Even though his master was already a legendary mage with magical domain, his chances of winning against nearly thirty adult night demon bats were slim. Norfeller, I've heard that the night demon bats' fresh blood can strengthen the abilities of vampires. If I can provide you with a large amount of night demon bats' blood, what kind of state do you think you can reach? Linley asked Norfeller as the night demon bats flew increasingly close. Master. Norfeller shouted anxiously. Reply to my question, remarked Linley calmly as he raised his magic staff. Yes, I'll probably level up to level 19, but if I want to reach the legendary level, I have to evolve on my own. Moved by his master's emotions, Norfeller miraculously calmed down while facing his approaching natural enemies. Noticing a most delicious vampire on the other side, that group of night demon bats screeched with excitement. Their bodies shone with increasing frequency, and then vanished completely all of a sudden. It was as if they used invisibility, only theirs was far superior. Invisibility could be immediately destroyed with a sprinkle of sparkling powder. These night demon bats, however, could shuttle into the shadow dimension. Not to mention sparkling powder, even bombarding this whole area with magic wouldn't harm them an inch. Unfortunately, these night demon bats didn't encounter an ordinary legendary mage, but one who could use the laws of light and darkness. Although Linley had yet to truly master the laws of light and darkness, with the two pieces of debris of the stars, holy light and gloomy dark, he could totally bring out the expected effect of the laws of light and darkness. Night Demon Bat's ability to shuttle through the shadow dimension was actually also a type of dark elemental rule. Competing with Lin Li who owned the debris of the stars, Gloomy Dark, however, was pretty much showing off skills in front of a master. Just as the Night Demon Bats disappeared, Lin Li's surroundings suddenly turned black and white, the laws of light and darkness from the magical domain were used in isolation. After that, those Night Demon Bats that entered the shadow dimension were forced out. The law of light immediately confined them. Without shadows, they had lost their ability to move. Still the same old saying, one thing went with another. In the abyss of Tharlan, even the most overbearing lord of darkness was defeated by a single ancient, demonic rune spell. How horrid these night demon bats were definitely wasn't a baseless rumor fabricated by people. Their ability to travel through the shadow dimension provided them with an unbeatable advantage from the start not mentioning their attacks which left their opponents unable to defend themselves effectively. Norfeller, it's your turn next. Suit yourself and bite, whichever is more pleasing to the eye, said Linley generously. Norfeller's heart was filled with gratitude at that moment. He obviously also knew that he wouldn't be helpful to his master anymore should he fail to enhance his abilities, so he didn't object. Mumbling spells characteristic of vampires, he made his sharp nail slice through the throat of a level 18 night demon bat. A stream of blood oozed out and gathered into a sphere in the midair. Next, that sphere of blood shrank until it became a droplet the size of a bean. Norfeller sucked the blood essence into his stomach. 
Seeing that Norfeller stopped after sucking the blood from one night demon bat, Lindley teased, Yo, help yourself, there's still so many. Norfeller respectfully replied, Thank you, master. This drop of blood essence is enough for me to absorb, for a period of time. Uchvalusi, do you want to have some too? Lindley was aware of Norfeller's situation, and so turned to Uchvalusi. Thank you for your concern, but this is useless to me, replied Uchvalusi immediately. Since those bats were already caught, then naturally, there was no reason to give them up. This world didn't have animal protection laws anyway. Lindley wasn't in a hurry to continue exploring the caves, so he attended to the twenty-plus night demon bats on the spot with the help of the two undead helpers. Night demon bats' blood essence was beneficial to vampires, but its magical crystal was also a rare treasure, to mages. Due to the small size of night demon bats, their magical crystals naturally weren't big. It was hard to imagine that a level 18 or 19 magical crystal was only the size of a green bean, but precisely because of the magical crystal's small size, it was the best material for crafting magical accessories since magical crystals weren't cuttable. For the crafting of most magical accessories, only the magical crystal from the bodies of magical worms were used to deal with the size problem. Most magical worms, however, had extremely low levels, the highest being no more than level 10, the worms won by numbers in the first place. If one were to socket a more advanced magical crystal in a pair of magical earrings, level 18 or 19 for example, then using the magical crystal from a magical beast was the only option. This kind of crystal was usually fist-sized, using it on earrings, could possibly pull the ears of the wearer off. For the same level of magical crystals, those of the night demon bat could be sold at more than ten times the price because of their rare quality of being both small in size and high in level. With twenty-seven night demon bat's magical crystals in his pocket, even if there was nothing deeper in the caves, Lin Li's trip was certainly already worth it. Continue forward, exclaimed Lin Li in high spirits, with a wave of his hand. He thought that even if there were some more groups of night demon bats, he could always catch more vampires as subordinates. How cool would it be to command a troop of level 19 vampires? Actually, Linley wasn't able to get anything much as he continued to survey the cave. After encountering the night demon bats, Linley seemed to have used up all his luck. At some unknown point in time, more low-level undead creatures, like skeletons, and vengeful spirits started blocking the way. Linley had some premonition at the moment. It was funny, but the high elves who had a so-called irreconcilable grudge with the undead creatures also lowered their prideful heads when faced with the merciless time to investigate the way to eternity using necromagic. Therefore, as Linley concluded, he had to see if undead creatures were actually present in order to find out whether the ruins and high elves were related. This certainly wasn't drivel, but words of experience. Looking at Norfeller's previous owner, or the one who fell to his death from the scar of death, which hadn't been a high elf investigating necromagic. So many years had passed since the end of the Dark Age. For the high elf's ruins to remain undiscovered until now, it was impossible that there wasn't anything to guard this place. This, suddenly, the scene was completely revealed. Linley was completely mesmerized by what he saw. An elegantly designed and lavishly, intricately decorated underground palace stood before the trio. No matter from which aspect, this magnificent underground palace was totally comparable to the royal palace of Felon Kingdom. The obvious architectural style from the Dark Age further confirmed Lin Li's speculations. In front of the palace was a small square. Hundreds of skeletal warriors armed with helmets and body armor dragged their rusted swords, walking aimlessly back and forth. Those swords had been dragged along repeatedly for so long that the stone floor was left with numerous deep marks. The appearance of the trio immediately drew the attention of the skeletal warriors. Although all the skeletal warriors were scattered around, orderless, almost all of them stopped in their tracks and turned towards the trio simultaneously. After a moment of stagnation, the warriors trod in the direction of the trio slowly while shaking their bodies. After coming here, there was nothing much to say. No matter whether Osric was really involved here, the palace was 80% sure to be related to the High Elves judging by its architectural style. 
Linley didn't even have to fight off these skeletal warriors, which didn't even reach level 10 himself. Norfeller zoomed into the crowd of skeletal warriors and instantly sent broken arms and bone fragments flying everywhere. Linley kept walking towards the palace gate, never slowing down. When he stood before the palace gate, Norfeller came to his side. The hundreds of skeletal warriors had all been smashed to pieces. Ah, such decadence! Those high elves have fallen to such a state. Linley gazed at the intricately designed palace gate. The same mageweth of the Song of Death was similar to the one found at Norfeller's previous master's place. However, a few details proved that the two mageweths weren't drawn by the same person. There was also a bigger difference, the mageweth on this gate either wasn't working, or had already been destroyed. Am I too late? Lindley was a little worried that some people had found this place before him. That would be too tragic. He inspected it carefully again to make sure there wasn't any trap on the gate. Then, he instructed Norfeller to push the gate open. Behind the gate was a courtyard of considerable size. Skeletal warriors were still present in the courtyard, only of slightly higher levels compared to those at the gate. They were more agile and their attacks weren't merely aimless stabs with their swords but rather had some hints of military training and techniques. However, this minor hindrance was unable to stop Linley. It was still Norfeller who made the move. Forty-odd skeletal warriors in the courtyard instantaneously turned into bone fragments strewn all over the ground. Walking past the corridor of the courtyard, Norfeller suddenly caught a few bone arrows and returned them backhandedly, crashing a few soul fires of level 12 skeletal archers. Walking along, the undead creatures they met were of increasing levels. However, they didn't meet any vampires, be it because they had already turned to bat feces or simply didn't dare to live here. When Linley finally reached the main hall gate of the palace, he was met with twenty level, sixteen, undead warriors. These warriors were reserves for the Death Knights. After they had subdued the shapeshifters and owned their own mounts, they could be considered Death Knights. Twenty undead warriors all armed with tailored magical equipment, the equipment still shown as if it was brand new even after so many years. Their weapons were also thin sharp magical longswords, commonly used by senior officers in the military. These warriors held their sheathed swords with grayish, shriveled hands, keeping them in the position to strike at any moment. They stood as still as statues, orderly and quiet on the steps of the main hall gate. Linley didn't want to waste any more time. He held his magic staff close to his chest and slowly recited a spell. Sensing danger ahead, those twenty undead warriors finally moved. They pounced down the steps like flashing lights. Thousand miles of ice. As the spell reached completion, Linley waved his magic staff. On the ground in front of Linley, crystal clear white frost condensed, and then spread forward rapidly like oil dripped in water. When the white frost reached the feet of the undead warriors, those warriors still in midair froze instantaneously and heavily fell to the ground, shattering into pieces like ceramics. Out of the twenty level sixteen undead creatures, not even one dared to come close to Linley. Whatever was in the palace would be revealed soon. Linley walked up the steps with the two undead servants. Striding past the remains of the undead warriors, they came to the front door of the main palace hall. The massive and extravagant door wasn't completely closed, the slit in it revealed deep darkness inside the palace hall. Norfeller and Ujfalusi walked forward and pushed the heavy doors open from both sides. The inside of the grand palace hall was finally unveiled in front of Linley's eyes. When seen from the entrance, the center of the hall was laid with lavish red carpet with gold decorative patterns. The pillars on its two sides were only half visible in the darkness. The carpet extended from the entrance all the way to the heart of the palace. On the other side of the carpet stood a tall, wide throne. On the throne sat a person, it was, surprisingly, a knight wrapped in thick armor. As the palace gate got pushed open, the magic lamps on top of the pillars lit up one by one. Perhaps the passage of time had diminished the energy of the magic lamps to the minimum, for the light emitted from each lamp could only illuminate the space around up to the radius of a palm. It was as though they could be extinguished any time. Linley and his two undead servants stood at the door vigilantly. 
they saw a figure on the throne, deep into the palace. Although the aura was very strong, it felt stagnant, within the darkness. This reassured Linley. After all, if the other party was living, he could have alarmed the person the moment he pushed open the doors. Linley could see the interior of the palace vaguely with the help of the faint glow emitted by the magic lamps. There was nothing much for him to look at. Apart from the black shadow seated on the throne that was located deep into the palace, the place was empty. Should I enter this place? Of course. Linley thought. Even if the thing in the palace was alive, he would have the ability to protect himself with his power as a legendary mage and the trump cards in his hands. This encouraged Linley to lead Ujfalusi and Norfeller on that luxurious red carpet and venture into the palace. Linley advanced towards the throne slowly under the faint glow from the magic lamps. It was then that he got to take a better look at the structure of the platform that held the throne. While the platform was made up of a pile of human bones, the throne was created from the bones of a humorous WYRM. It didn't look like one, of course, but it was still obvious to anyone who saw it. As compared to the gigantic throne, the person seated on it was relatively frail. To Linley and his team, however, it did not feel that there was any disconcertment about the contrast of the two. The person was seated on the throne with his upper body slightly leaning forward. There was a sword in his right hand, and one of his feet was on top on the bones of the WYRM in front of him. Although the body was still, there was a strong sense of dignity that continued to fill the surroundings. Although Uchfalusi and Norfeller tried to stand in front of their master in an attempt to protect him, their bodies could not help but tremble due to the powerful aura, that was the obvious difference among undead creatures of dissimilar abilities. Despite having courage, the pressure felt from the superiors was not something that could be ignored. The figure of the person on the throne came into greater clarity as they proceeded closer. He had silver and white hair and blade-like brows. His eyelids were hung low, and he had a straight nose and broad mouth. Despite being ashen and pallid, he was still a very good-looking man, and donned a dull golden full-body armor that had been detailed with intricate mageweth. There were head bones of hideous single-horned demons decorating his joints, and on his back was a crimson cape that seemed to be stained by dried-up blood. The contrast in colors with the plain white throne created even more trepidation within people. Linley was reminded of his experience at the Scar of Death with the sense of the aura emitted by the man. He thought of the bunch of death knights he'd taken under himself. Although there was a stark contrast in power between them and the man on the throne, he was able to confirm that the man on the throne was a retribution knight with his distinct aura. The strength of his aura was only something that could be emitted by legendary powerhouses. Linley was absolutely certain that the man before him was that retribution knight. Jirian had never mentioned to him that there would be a retribution knight here. Linley, however, was certain that Jirian would not be somebody who had ill intentions for him. Despite calling him a little bastard, the concern Jirian had for Linley was definitely authentic. Linley could be sure that Jirian would have told him everything mentioned in that diary without reservations. Hence, it would simply mean that this information wasn't recorded in the diary. Actually, encountering a retribution knight here was both within and outside Linley's expectations. It would only be unusual for Linley not to encounter any undead creature here when he had already met so many others outside the palace. However, the man was a retribution knight, after all. Where could possibly be his team of death knights? If there was an ambush of death knights here, the only action Linley could take was to escape. Despite having the team of death knights he'd acquired in the Scar of Death, Linley knew that death knights under a retribution knight would definitely be different. These knights would naturally be rid of the chance for further progress when they pledged their allegiance to a retribution knight, for they had to surrender all spiritual force they'd acquired to him. Yet, they also got to rise in power with the progress of their retribution knight when they participated in battles. Just when Linley was deducing the origin of that retribution knight, a voice sounded in his head. Oh, it is the rare retribution knight. Hold on. That dude looks very familiar. That was the self-proclaimed all-knowing and almighty soul traitor. Linley's heartbeat accelerated when he heard Canoris's words. 
Canoris was an ancient deity who had been around for God knew how many years. If he were to find that fella familiar, he wouldn't be any common passerby. You've seen him before? Where? Linley asked Canoris as he cautiously sized up the retribution knight who was sitting on the throne. Fret not. Let me think. Where have I seen him? Canoris racked his brains in an effort to recall it. However, the fact that he had been living as a soul for a significant amount of time, a soul that had suffered some damage, prevented him from remembering who the retribution knight before him was. Hey, have you recalled who he was? One word, and we will either be leaving or staying here. Tell me quickly, Linley urged Canoris on impatiently. Although he was not certain if that fellow was asleep, he was, after all, a retribution knight. As a legendary mage, Linley could not help but feel stressed if he had to deal with a retribution knight. If I'm not wrong. I think I saw him in the breezy plains. Other than that. I can remember no more, Canoris replied vexedly. For an ancient deity, his state was really pitiful. Retribution knight. Breezy plains, Linley muttered after Canoris. Suddenly, he recalled the secret Hutton had shared with him. There was a retribution knight who, after acquiring an arm of the immortal king, led a team of death knights in ransacking the breezy plains. The death toll they brought about was a third of the entire breezy plains population. Could the figure before him be the retribution knight who had ransacked the breezy plains and turned it into a living hell? Wasn't he purified by Prophet Willen from the brilliant shrine? Why would he come to this place? Lin Li's mind was buzzing with questions. He told Canoris the secret Hutton shared with him, hoping it might trigger Canoris's memory. Before this, Hutton has once told me about the Retribution Knight. But, he said that the Retribution Knight had been purified by Prophet Willen of the Brilliant Shrine. Could this be that Retribution Knight? Linley asked. He thought the process of purification would have allowed the holy light or fire turn the night into dust. How could he be sitting here like a statue? Sure enough, Lin Li's words lifted Canoris' memory gate. The recovery of memories was a very beautiful feeling for this pitiful fella, especially when those memories could portray himself as knowledgeable. Are you referring to the retribution knight, Rodhart? Now that you mention it, I think that this fella really does look like him, said Canoris. He is called Rodhart? Linley was intrigued. Hutton did not tell him the name of the retribution knight. What else do you know about Rod Hart? Canoris's current favorite pastime was to boast his knowledge to Linley. Especially after Linley experienced tremendous growth, the only thing left for Canoris to prove his worth was the knowledge he'd gained over the years. You have to be clueless about what Rod Hart did before that. He was the most powerful paladin ever since the establishment of the brilliant shrine. Paladin. You are saying that this retribution knight was a paladin in the past? Linley stared at the Retribution Knight, who was seated on the throne before him and had yet to move an inch. He realized how crazy this world could be. The High Elves who were supposed to have a deep-seated hatred for the undead creatures actually had all sort of connections with the undead, and a paladin from the Brilliant Shrine actually turned into a murderous Retribution Knight that killed the innocent. Before, Canoris had loved to create a sense of suspense with his words to satisfy his ego. However, things were different now. He did not dare to keep anything from Linley, for fear that the man would deny his wish for a new body. Hence, before Linley could ask further, Canoris told him everything he knew about Rodhart in detail. The stories of Rodhart were not well known to the people of Anrel. It was not only due to the fact that a long time had passed, but also the cruel irony for the brilliant shrine whose paladin had transformed into a retribution knight. Rodhart's background was simple. His life was as plain as a cup of tap water before he became famous. He was under the care of a priest in the brilliant shrine when he was young, and he and his peers were orphans who were educated under the strictures of the brilliant shrine. These people would be the most loyal in any organization. They were known as the fanatical devotees to religious forces, as well as death knights to secular forces. In the entire brilliant shrine, Fanatical devotees were the ones who everyone thought wouldn't betray the organization. Their beliefs were supposed to be the strongest and most extreme due to their strict religious upbringing. 
Hence, most of the talented ones were chosen by the priest to become the blades for Brilliant Shrine to eliminate heresy. When Rod Hart was fifteen years old, he got through all of the tests held by the referee of heresy and entered the organization with a few other talented youths. During this period of time, the Inquisition was the most mysterious organization under the Brilliant Shrine. It made it almost impossible for his exploits to be made known to the public, at most with the exception of the records of his participation in missions, as well as the date and results of his achievements in the cleansing of any heresy. People only started knowing Rodhart when he reached the legendary realm at 32 years old. That was the first time he led a mission as the referee of heresy, where he tried to purify a legendary lich who owned a humorous WYRM. In that mission, Rod Hart did not rely on any of his men. He became famous after he slew both the lich and the humorous WYRM single-handedly. The tremendous power the young paladin demonstrated in the subsequent missions elevated his position in the Brilliant Shrine, crowned as the most indomitable head referee of the Brilliant Shrine ever since its establishment. There were many people in the shrine who viewed him as an idol. Oh? How did he become a death knight when he was supposed to be one of the fanatical devotees? Linley asked, curiously. How could a head referee of Brilliant Shrine, brought up as a strong believer, be converted into an undead creature? Not to mention that he was a head referee. Any common priest who believed in brightness would not have been easily converted into an undead creature. I'm not sure. But, it is not unusual, either. No one would be able to reject the temptation of immortality. Didn't the arrogant high elves go study necromagic? To paladins, their ability would be as good as stagnant once they reached the legendary realm. If not, they would have to seek other ways to improve themselves, said Canoris, disdainfully. Rodhart entered the mausoleum of the immortal king in hopes of finding the path towards the sanctuary realm. No one knew what he experienced in a mortal king's mausoleum or what he experienced when he was on his journey there. They only knew that head referee resigned from his position and never set foot in Brilliant Shrine again. Some people said that Rodhart was inspired to retreat into a century of seclusion to look for the path into the sanctuary realm, but there were also others who thought that he left to treat his serious injuries. No matter what happened, the news of the death of the strongest paladin of Brilliant Shrine, the legendary powerhouse, broke out after a century. Rod Hartswell asked for burial in the grounds of the Breezy Plains, the place where he had been adopted. Thank you for watching Mystic Realms Recap. Please like share and subscribe. Have a great day.